Audiobook title, Edge of Finality, 00-12, by Like Horus. This work belongs to author, Like Horus. Source, Royal Road and ScribbleHub.com. Prologue, The Great Dissolution The Infinite Cycle. Location, Unknown. Time, Unknown. Within this dark and empty void where all things ceases to be, the land and sky appeared as if the universe itself had textures missing. A cloaked woman could be seen gracefully maneuvering through a hail of bullets, the glint of her blade dancing solemnly through the air as if it was a ritual dedicated to the gods, causing a shower of sparks with each bullet she parries. Though the gunfire had nary an effect on her it had served its purpose in suppressing her movements, preventing her from closing the distance towards her target. In the distance stood a dark figure, cloaked within a veil of shadowy mist that obfuscated their figure. It blended in almost perfectly against the pitch black emptiness of the void, detectable only due to its glowing red eyes. The figure stood there unmoving, its eyes trained onto the hooded woman. You have no fight left to fight, so why do you still resist? Everything you hold dear is already gone. A voice whispered from behind the cloaked woman. She slashed her blade instinctively behind her. Cutting open the throat of a small girl no older than the age of eight, a comically large amount of blood poured out of the wound, and pooled around the girl's feet, dyeing the ground a bright crimson. The girl's emotionless face suddenly changed as if her expressions were lagging behind. Her eyes widened and started tearing up, she opened her mouth to speak but all that came out was gurgling noises as blood started pouring out of her mouth. She gripped at her throat attempting to plug the wound but a no avail as blood continuously leaked out through the gaps of her fingers. She collapsed onto the ground writhing in pain as the pool of blood on the ground stained her white dress and deep crimson. Why, sister, didn't you say you were gonna protect me? The girl painfully moaned, as the light began to leave her eyes. The woman looked at the struggling girl with cold dead eyes, her facing unflinching in front of such a sight. The girl crawled towards the cloaked woman, her hand outstretched, before a blade plunged into her body, severing her life completely as her hand tumbled lifelessly onto the ground. He he he, my how cold you have grown sister. What the name of this child again? Oh right. It was something like Lilia. Oh how she loved you so much after you saved her from those monsters. You were like her knight in shining armor that saved the princess from evil. She fell in love with you immediately even though she knew that you and her will never work out. I wonder what she will think seeing you now. <laughs> a snickering voice came out from within the lifeless corpse of the child known as Lilia. Silence. With a snap of her finger the body of Lilia ignited in a blaze causing a horrific scream to echo through the area as her body squirmed within the flames. After the blaze went out, nothing remained of Lilia's corpse. Ha ha ha. I can see it. The fires of vengeance yet burns within you, very well, if you are not willing to give up, I have but no choice. The temperature in the area suddenly began rising as beads of sweat began trickling down the cloaked woman's face. She turned round and saw the area around the shadowed figure has started shimmering as the view around them starts to distort. The time of rest is at hand. At this moment, the life of the stars shall know only death. Let the fires of dissolution manifest as its breath encompasses all, at Rhodes end shall the cycle repeat. An ominous chant ensued, originating from the shadowed figure, its voice male yet female, young yet old, distant yet close, all overlapping with one another. Even at a distance, the heat was piercing as her sweat began to evaporate as soon as it forms, she started panting, gasping for air. As breathing was beginning to get difficult, the scorching air searing her lungs. Through the heat and pain she raised her arms in front of her and began chanting, with each word spoken, the blinding pain threatened to sever her consciousness, as she inhaled more of the burning air. Weary the weight of the stars, but under their withers does your eternal power stand indomitable, shield of the shining goddess, all shalt burn should you fall, you who stands before the stars, with her words. Her breathing returned to normal as the temperature in her immediate surroundings began to notably drop. However, the respite was but fleeting as her power was inferior to that of her opponents and the temperature around her steadily began to rise once again. I believe in an age long past this was called, 
Manifest yourself as thy name is Svalin eternal chilling shield of the goddess Brahma Pralaya the great dissolution. Within the dark void a brilliant flash of light chased away the eternal darkness, before a destructive wave of energy rent the land asunder, colliding with a thin veil of light deployed by the hooded woman. Though the thin barrier looks like it should have been shattered almost immediately from the barrage of chaotic energies, it stood unyielding, stemming the tide of energies. Anything that came in contact with the light was immediately disintegrated leaving nothing behind, even the ground which was normally indestructible was not spared as the primordial energies reduced them to their base particles. The cloaked woman falls to her knees, as she struggles to maintain Svalin, though Svalin managed to mitigate most of the damage. Her flesh began to sizzle as an acrid smell of burning flesh began filling the air, layers of skin started sloughing off in droves and blackened chunks of flesh fell onto the ground still smoldering as the ground nearly turns molten, her body slowly falling apart due to the extreme heat, exposing both muscle and bone her blood boiling away. The only consolation was that she could not feel any of it as majority of her nerves had long been burned off, she stood there unmoving facing the relentless onslaught of the destructive energies able to tear universes asunder, her will unbending. For a moment of hesitation or the faltering of her concentration will surely spell her demise. Within what felt like eternity she reminisced on the past, about how she lost everything to the monster that she currently faces, her friends her home, her loved ones, her family, everything she cared about ripped away from her with unfeeling cruelty, her heart long exhausted, her emotions dried up, the only thing pushing her forward was the flames of vengeance still burning within her chest. Now she stands alone at the end of everything, facing her inevitable end against evil incarnate, she didn't care what happens to her, even should she walk out of here alive there would be nothing awaiting her return. She needed to at least damage her target, she wanted to, she had to, even should she perish in the process. She didn't know how much time had passed, it could have been a few seconds, minutes or even hours, she didn't know. But the primordial energies battering Svalin soon settled down and everything returned to normal. One wouldn't have been able to tell that anything had happened were it not for the massive crater that stretched on indefinitely that opened within the void. The only places spared was a small section of land where Svalin was deployed and at the epicenter of the crater where the cause of the destruction stood. Clap clap clap. Amazing. Though it wasn't at full power you managed to survive the energies meant to destroy universes, for such a feat reward is certainly in order. <laughs> I know. How about I allow you to hit me once, I won't defend or evade your attack, it a good deal for you know. The shadowed figure exclaimed as if it was a child that found a new toy to play with. Ah, I would like nothing better. I can only manage one final attack anyways. Her voice was hoarse and cracked, it was painful even to breathe much less speak. Half of her face was burnt beyond recognition, she was missing an eye and her jaw was partially exposed. Chunks of flesh were missing from various parts of her body. The only silver lining was that the heat also managed to cauterize her injuries so she was in no danger of bleeding out at the moment. Her clothes and cloak was almost completely incinerated and the remaining pieces of fabric had melted onto her skin, or at least what remained of it. It was a miracle she was even alive much less conscious and standing. Then let me experience the final embers of your life in all its glory, hopefully, it will suitably entertain me. Ah, I will make sure you enjoy it, so much that you perish. Well said, I would expect nothing less. Come at me. This cycle's final life form. With this final attack she channeled every ounce of remaining energy she had, every ounce of her being, every ounce of her hatred. Everything of hers was drained with not a single drop remaining. This was her last stand. She was granted her final chance at revenge, she would make sure that that monster would forever regret its decision. Restraints lifted, limiter released, awaken, vengeful cursed blade, your bloodthirst shall be sated, let thy hatred consume, me and all, her beloved blade that she had used for years. Once a pure white blade with golden accents and hilt, was now dyed a pitch black as though one is staring straight into the abyss. An ominous purple black energy coated the blade, its energy causing a localized space time distortion. With its true name released, its strike defies causality. 
its blade never breaking, its strike never missing, and its target always eliminated, capable of cutting down anything in its way, its power comes with great cost, more than most would be willing to pay, their life, here and now let the second of the three great evils be committed, kill, tiffing loathsome curse of three great evils, the cursed blade sung and its strike true, there was no fanfare, no explosions, no nothing, just silence, ha ha, well done, small fractures started forming on the shadowed figure, slowly propagating across its entire body, its form soon shattered like broken glass, its particles scattering gently into the wind, before disappearing entirely, sigh, so I failed, even after everything, she pierced Tiffing into the ground using it for support as she can feel the last vestiges of her life slipping away, devoured by Tiffing, partially correct, what you destroyed was but a shadow of myself but your attack did successfully injure my main body, albeit a minor wound, still causality, was overturned and this wound will never heal even should an eternity go by, your blade had killed it, whispered the entity, its voice entering directly into her head, countless eyes began opening from within the darkness from every direction, as numerous as the stars that could be observed in the night sky, their focus solely on her, tentacles then breached the abyss, surrounding her, each tentacle the size of mountains, enough to crush her easily even at her peak, from within the mass of giant squirming tentacles, a smaller one approached her, slowly, barely the width of an arm, the entity extended the small tentacle in front her as if for a handshake, you are the first to ever damage me, so I will give you an offer, join me and I will grant you eternal life, be an extension of my will in the next world and I shall grant your every desire, if you accept you need only grab my hand, I refuse, she said without hesitation, there was no need to consider, even should her existence disappear for eternity, she would never accept that offer, why, I do not understand, throughout history the quest for eternal life, immortality, free from worries, have been the objective for many species throughout the entire universe, I have seen it, I know it, and yet, you deny such an opportunity when many others wouldn't hesitate in accepting such an offer, why, the entity said, puzzled at her decision, a moment of silence drifted between the two, ah ha ha, her manic laughter resounded through the void, is my query that amusing, I do not understand, the entity replied, perplexed, for a near omnipotent entity that holds the knowledge of the entire universe, you sure are dull, with how you acted earlier in our fight I expected different, but it seems I was wrong, go figure it out yourself, you have an eternity to do so after all, she said amused, she walked closer to the edge of the crater, in front of her a drop into the never-ending infinite void awaits, see you, oh pitiful one, I'm tired, I will head off now, bidding her farewell, she raised what remained of her tattered arm and gave a sarcastic wave off to the entity, she grabbed her beloved tiffing as she tipped herself over the edge, her body plummeting into the primordial sea below, never to be seen again, what a shame, the entity's voice resounding in the now empty universe of its own making, now at road's end, the time of rest is at hand, all alone once again, the infinite cycle shall commence, announcement, thank you for reading this novel, this is my first ever writing project thus, comments and criticism would be much appreciated, I will try and slowly improve based on feedback as I continue writing, release schedule will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday, GMT plus 85A0C1 Avalon and the Coalition Meeting, Location, Bridge, Planetary Assault Carrier Avalon, Numa Star System, Year, 1500 GSD, at the edge of the Numa Star System gathered a massive fleet of ships, a coalition formed from factions hailing from all sectors of the galaxy, it was unprecedented for all the participating factions to be standing side by side as allies, but through shaky alliances and agreements was such a feat possible, probably the first and last time these factions would be able to work together in this manner. Commander, we are receiving a transmission from Coalition Command. They want to discuss the battle plans again. A woman entered the bridge and reported. The woman had shoulder-length light blonde hair and blue eyes a stern yet gentle expression on her face, she was dressed in a standard looking military officer uniform, 
she carried a file and information tablet in her hands at all times. Sitting in the center of the bridge was girl of young age she had waist length silver hair and silver eyes. She also wore a black military officer dress, along with black cap and cape. She leaned her head against her hand, legs crossed over each other as she stared out at the every increasing amount of ships gathering at the relay point through the bridge's windows. What do those they want again? We just had another one of their useless meetings a few hours ago. We all know this meeting will go down the same way as the dozen others that came before, Commander. Yeah, yeah, battle plans right? Talking about tea and biscuits would probably be more productive than whatever will be discussed here. Hey, I know how about we make a better Lissa. If this meeting is productive I will fulfill one request of yours and if it's not smack, as she climbed atop her chair and turned around to propose this bet of hers, she was smacked in the face with a file that Alyssa carried, as unknown to her, Alyssa had silently approached her seat while she was ranting about the upcoming meeting. Gah, that hurts, more importantly why are you still carrying that damn thing around with you everywhere you go? Is that like your true body or something? Who even uses those things anymore? Commander, please focus and return to your normal position. The meeting is about to start and I will be patching us through shortly, and remember, show proper decorum suitable for one in your position. How many time have you said that same line already? Rhea said, mimicking Alyssa's voice. It's because, before, Alyssa could finish her sentence, four holographic screens appeared in front of the pair. Within each screen was a leader of their respective factions. Good day Captain Rhea. Glad you could join us on short notice and sorry for disturbing you even as you are certainly busy preparing for the battle ahead, it seems you are well too adjutant Alyssa. Good day to you two Admiral Zects, it wasn't much of a bother. After all discussing the battle ahead is important after all. Operating the data tablet, Alyssa pulled up relevant information on the people present in the meeting. Admiral Gregory Zects, an old grizzled man with a stout and robust body. Exceptional for his old age, he is the highest ranking admiral from the United Terran Systems and is their commander for the battle ahead. Though he sported a stern look all the time, he had a soft heart and often used his stature to hide the fact that he cares dearly for those under his command. He would often drink and eat with the troops causing him to be very well liked, boosting morale when he was in charge. The United Terran Systems a democracy made up of people elected representatives from each of the colonized worlds, forming a governing body in their capital world of terror. They prided themselves on their military presence and served as the so-called peacekeepers of the neutral sector. A beautiful Rhea, it is such an honor for me to be able to grace my eyes with your presence. Your shimmering silver hair like sunlight breaking through the clouds after a stormy night. Your silver rise like a shining pearl glimmering within the dark seas and your unblemished silky smooth skin white as the purest snow. Marry me. You flatter me, your majesty Alan, but I would have to reject your proposal. Your other six wives certainly wouldn't appreciate me marrying you out of the blue wouldn't they? Nonsense. None of my words were but mere flattery. They were nothing but truth. Besides my wives wouldn't object to the marriage they all have nothing but good impressions about you and they will understand my boundless love for all of you. How about a celebration of our marriage I will give you my beautiful daughter Ali. In that instance the video feed from King Alan IV of the Kingdom of Ypres suddenly cut out. Ouch that hurts. Who dares hit me? When I find out I will. You will what? Ah. My lovely wife Aisha. Let's talk things out okay? So nicely put that chair down and ah, someone save me. A short scream could be heard through the communicator before the heavy sound of a chair impacting something could be heard. Sorry for the interruption, his majesty has suffered an unfortunate accident, such a tragedy, and thus will be recuperating in his room for the duration of this meeting. I am General Aisha leader of the kingdom's armed forces and I will be representing the kingdom during this meeting. Alicia introduced herself, acting as if nothing happened, perhaps she did not know that the audio was not muted. King Alan IV of Ypres was a famous womanizer throughout the galaxy, he flirted and courted many beautiful and talented women who specialized in a variety of different fields, in the end he married six of them who successfully fell for his advances, 
though one would have expected massive infighting and chaos within the king's harem when so many beautiful women of such caliber were gathered in one place but their relationship is known to be harmonious and stable, relatively speaking. General Aisha was the first wife and the current leader of the kingdom's armed forces. The couple met when King Alan and General Aisha were still a prince and a captain respectively. Stories tell that the at the time Prince Alan went on many campaigns with Captain Aisha to increase his military achievements before succeeding his further on the throne and on one fateful night during a bout of heavy drinking at a party to celebrate another successful campaign, the two spent the night together and the next day they declared their marriage though the parties involved never seek to accept or deny that such an event ever took place and thus it remained a mystery till this day. Such drivel, that sight of that weak man sickens me. Were it not for Admiral's acts and Commanderia over here I would have never bothered to attend this meeting, much less join this coalition. Actually, with the new face of General Elisha here it makes it three of which I approve of being here. Slam. Hold your tongue you barbaric brute or I will rip it out from where you stand. I would not stand for your insults against his majesty, though he might be a weak-willed, useless man who does nothing but flirt with anything that resembles a woman who passes by those shit-covered eyes of his. He is still a very competent leader in times of crisis. So take back your words great Khan or I will force you to. I like your attitude general. I will consider it if you can make me. Ha ha ha, the great Khan, no one knows his real name. His origins are shrouded in mystery, no one knows where he came from. Even those specializing in gathering and digging up information have no information of him before he showed up as the great Khan. It's as if he popped up from nowhere one day. But what is known is that since his appearance he has gathered up pirates and outcasts of society from various other factions and formed a powerful and stronger military force comparable to those of other nations. Most mercenary groups in the galaxy are also affiliated with the Khanate in some way with only one exception. The Khanate then went on a conquering spree in the neutral sectors, quickly expanding the area of influence only stopping after half the neutral sectors was under his rule. The Khan rules with an iron fist, he greatly respects those who are strong, though many do not know what his definition of strength really means. Some were synonymous with strength such as Admiral Zekts and General Aisha who had many military achievements under their belt but there are many others with similar achievements such as the ever disappointing King Alan but unlike the former the latter wasn't respected by the Great Khan. Another example was Commandria, who by all accounts was pretty similar to the Khan in terms of their position, though the early documentation of Commandria's activities, are much more readily available as compared to that of the Khan. Now now, let's not start fighting alright? A young man interjected into the brewing conflict between the General Aisha and the Great Khan, adjusting his glasses that perpetually hid his eyes causing a glint. With his word the two parties in question stopped bickering, showing the massive influence he is even within this meeting filled with some of the most important people in the galaxy. As an old saying goes time is money and thus as the major shareholder of Luna Corporation and the appointed representative of the neutral sectors I say we get the meeting along already. Seeing as I am the one who joined this meeting, I would like nothing more than for us to get to the main point, as I know all of you are pretty busy. Frederick Marlin or simply the owner as most know him by, the major shareholder of Luna Corporation owning about 65% of the available shares. Luna Corporation was a mega corporation spanning the entire galaxy. The prided themselves in having everything and anything available for purchase. From things such as raw materials to starships and services ranging from simple things such as food catering or transportation to more shady underground services such as smuggling to contract killing. As long as one had the purchasing power anything was possible at Luna Corporation. Rumors have it that Frederick was the one who sponsored the Great Khan in the early years of conquest in exchange of favors, it was simply impossible for the Great Khan to have risen so quickly and conquered with such terrifying ferocity without a hidden sponsor behind them, the favors were then used by Frederick to sabotage his rivals to allow him to buy out their business at a lower cost and then using his financial power gained from acquiring many profitable business to purchase the shares of other shareholders of Luna Corp, after some persuasions and unfortunate accidents of course.
Now that we are all here and ready to begin the discussion, I noticed that someone here has barely gotten their fair chance to speak. So how about you help us start off the meeting Commander Ria, Frederick proposed, smirking. Damn you fake four eyes, fine, Commander Ria, leader of the private military company, PMC, Avalon. So Ona why don't you tell us why you have gathered us for this meeting. I will pretend I did not hear that first part and your introduction was also pretty uninspiring but it will suffice he said, readjusting his glasses once again. And then there was us, who was pretty out of place in this meeting if one did not know any better, private military company Avalon, named after their mothership of the same name. Lead by the young commander Ria, not much is known about her before she joined the mercenary scene, but she started out just like any other independent mercenary, relatively unknown in the field but after a series of high-profile missions and achievements she started steadily gaining fame as a upcoming star rookie. However, after participating in a relatively safe mission with other mercenaries, the entire group disappeared and were never seen again. After around 17 years had passed, Commander Ria suddenly reappeared, commanding the Avalon. The Avalon was an out-of-place artifact by every sense of the word. The technology it held was leaps and bounds over anything available currently. Of course this drew the eyes of many powerful factions, most of whom are currently sitting in this meeting. The factions tried their hardest either via diplomacy or force to try to get Rhea over to their side, in order to gain access of the Avalon for if they could manage to reverse engineer the technologies within they will acquire a massive edge over the others, however, Commandria rejected all of them and for those who tried to use force, well let's just say with exception to the Khan they no longer exist, she then created the Avalon PMC, recruiting many elite mercenaries and ex-military personnel from across the galaxy, when asked about where she acquired the Avalon, she will laugh the question off citing mistakes of youth or she made me not tell, though no one knows who the she in her statements is referring to nor the mistake. Very well, if everyone is ready, I will begin. Just a few hours ago, shortly after our previous meeting, my informant surprised me of a new development at our destination. It took me a while to confirm the legitimacy of the information but after confirming its validity and accuracy a short while ago, I decided to convene this meeting to share my findings. Normally, this information would cost a hefty sum but seeing as we are in the same boat, it will be on the house. After pausing for a brief moment in case there were any questions to be said, Frederick continued, it has been reported that, very well, I would now adjourn this meeting. Seeing as our more experienced combat members agree that regardless of the recent findings, it will not change our tactics by a wide margin due to a lack of detailed information, which I so happen to agree to. Let us take this final few hours to do any last minute preparations and get some rest. Frederick out. After his closing statements, Frederick disconnected himself from the call, though I do not usually agree with that sly fox. I have to concur that further discussion is moot and we should get some rest. The next time we meet will be on the fields of battle. Good hunting. After a short few words, the great Khan too followed suit and disconnected, I will head off too. I need to convene a meeting with my officers to discuss the contents of this meeting. General Aisha, Commander Arena, and Adjutant Alyssa, do have a good rest and I would like to invite all of you to a round of drinks on me after the battle. You should quit drinking already old man, your hair gets greyer every time I see you. You should take care of yourself more, at this rate you will look like a corpse even before you retire. Ha ha ha, will do Commander Ria, though I will decline giving up drinking, it is one of the pleasure this old man has left after all, I will head off now. Have a good rest. After General Zekts disconnected, it was only Alicia, Rhea and Alyssa left in the conference. Rhea, I won't say anything more but you make sure you take care of my daughter there. In the battle ahead make sure you take care of Alyssa and if by any chance something goes wrong, please keep my daughter's input into account. She is already a grown woman and I cannot watch over her forever. So whatever decisions in the battle ahead I will respect it. But. If you both come back alive I wouldn't mind giving her over to you. Mother. We are not like that. Alyssa exclaimed, her face blushing. You fufu. I understand my precious daughter. So what's your response Rhea? 
you didn't have to say it to begin with, I will protect her as I promised back then. I have also always respected her decisions when she is with me and this time won't be any different, glad to hear it, have a good rest you too, Alicia out. 3 A 0 C 2 day before the battle, location, bridge, planetary assault carrier Avalon, Numa star system, year, 1500 GSD. With the disconnection from General Alicia, the call ended leaving Ryu and Alyssa alone together on the bridge. An unknown mega structure huh, it is pretty concerning but without more specific details, we cannot readily plan around it. If it contributes to the battle then it would be wise to try to take it offline as an unknown mega structure could cause untold amounts of damage. But if it does not contribute to the battle and we target it, we would be wasting precious resources on actions that would not benefit us. Rhea then interacted with the console in front of her, displaying a huge amount of files on the crystal holotable in front of her. She began to interact with the hollow files before gathering all of the files up in a ball and tossing it towards Alyssa's tablet. What are these schematics and research data? Alyssa questioned as she scrolled off the staggering amount of files sent to her tablet. It's research data and projects compiled by Myra based on technologies found in Avalon and data in the archives. It shows possible schematics and data on various mega structures that could be built using the current technologies and knowledge available to the factions with exception to us. It also contains complete data on the mega structures currently known to be have been constructed in the galaxy. I have already filtered all the unnecessary data of known mega structures and unlikely mega structures that we would likely encounter during the battle. If you had this, why didn't you bring it up during the meeting? No wait that was a foolish question. It was obvious that you couldn't. Just a cursory glance at the list of mega structures in this file shows that there are many things here while capable of being built by the other factions, they wouldn't be able to conceive them normally. I assume you want me to study the brief characteristics and profiles of each mega structure so I am able to identify them when the time comes? Correct and I want you to pay close attention to the final mega structure in that list. If there is any sign that that super weapon might be around I need you to inform me immediately. Rhea grimly said. A layered singularity core? What is this? I have never heard of something like this before. Alyssa stares into the screen as she flips through the information on the topic. Of course you have heard no mention of that thing. It is theoretically at the limit of what the current technological prowess of the galaxy could achieve and yet the weapon is what I consider one of if not the most dangerous items in the unfiltered folder where the files I passed you originated from. Rhea says gesturing to the massive folder displayed on the holotable. I understand, it shouldn't take too long to go through this list, alright. Now that the serious things are out of the way let's go get something to eat, I am starving. As if a switch had been flipped, Raya immediately dropped her serious mode and returned to her cheerful self. She jumps out of her chair and happily made her way to the bridge's exit. Couldn't you have the drones deliver the food to us? Alyssa questions. With the Dragoon pilots and the remaining crew along their ships deployed to the decoy fleet, it's only us on the ship right now, a rare occurrence. Honestly, I just want an excuse to take a short trip with you. So just come along. Rhea gives a bright smile to Alyssa as she gestures for her to follow. Seeing Rhea's smile, Alyssa stood still and watched as Rhea happily made her way to the exit. A warm feeling spreading within her chest as she looks at the retreating back of Rhea. She closes her eyes as she savors this warm and fluttering feeling within her chest. A nostalgic memory plays within her mind of that fateful day where she and Rhea first met. A smile subconsciously plastered on her face. Wow. I didn't know you can smile like that. You are always so strict and stoic. You should really show that more often. Everyone would totally be over you. But maybe that isn't such a good thing. Yes, can't have anyone trying to steal you from me. Rhea teases, her voice right next to Alyssa. Alyssa abruptly opened her eyes, seeing Rhea's face right in front of her whilst sporting a cheeky grin and hearing her say such words while she was having a nostalgic moment caused her brain to malfunction with conflicting feelings. Her face started turning red as she blushed uncontrollably, blood rushing to her hand. Rhea, Rhea, Rhea. Alyssa stammers as her body started trembling. Rhea repeats, tilting her head to the side. 
Rhea. Alyssa shrieked as she took her file and clobbered Rhea over the head with it. Jr. Why? Rhea's yelp of pain echoing throughout the bridge. Upon leaving the bridge they entered a hallway at the end of which was an elevator leading to the ship's other decks. The size of the Avalon was more akin to a floating fortress city than that of a typical starship. Its massive size allowed it to house multiple capital-class warships ranging from destroyers, cruisers, battleships and even carriers. Within its hangars that spanned across the entire length of the ship, though all but one of the capital ships have been deployed to participate in the decoy fleet. The remaining hangar space has been reassigned to an increased fleet of small automated craft such as fighters and bombers. The Avalon was completely self-sufficient capable of sustaining a complete crew over an indefinite period of time, able to grow food and produce essential supplies such as materials needed for repairs and ammunition by itself. The ship consists of multiple specialized sectors and the massive hangar at the bottom most deck. The sectors comprised of the Offensive Cluster, Planetary Assault Cluster, Flight Control Systems, Defensive Cluster, Fabrication Cluster, Engineering Suites, Life Support Systems, Medical Ward, Entertainment District, and Experimental Research Center. Connecting all these various sections was a centerline path that ran through the length of the ship, large enough for multiple vehicles to pass through side by side also known as the trail to the crew. Arriving at the trail, what well, was normally a bustling area reminiscent of a market with crews from docked ships walking up and down a path towards their destination as they were performing their daily activities aboard the ship, now completely empty of life. The pair walked to the center of the trail dubbed the The Hub, where members of the PMC could receive missions at the self-service kiosk which displays contracts that have been verified by the company and which is suitable for them. They could also request other services here such as repairing and rearming their vessels among other things. Members could receive benefits depending on their rank within the company, which is a value assigned to them based on mainly their skills and trust the company had in them among other factors. To the side of the hub was the pair's destination, a bar named the Weeping Willow. Upon entering, a quiet calming melody of smooth jazz greeted the pair's ears. The bar was bathed in a dim orange light, sets of sofas arranged in a circular pattern with tables in the center for groups of patrons to drink and dine. The circular bar placed in the center of the room had a black marble countertop with bar stools placed at several intervals around it. The bar wall was a beautifully and intricately sculpted tree made from an unknown material. At the bottom of the sculpture slots were carved into the tree to allow for the placement of countless spirits. As the pair walked towards the bar, the sounds of their heels clicking on the wooden floor alerted the middle-aged man standing behind the bar to their presence. The man had graying white hair in a classic side part, and wore a typical butler outfit. Mistress Rhea, Mistress Alyssa I was not expecting you today. So how may I be of service? The man said, his voice full of eloquence as he gave light bow. Sebastian, I am starving right now. Do you have anything cooking? Rhea cheerfully said as she plopped herself onto one of the bar stools. Sorry for disturbing you at this time Sebastian, but could I also trouble you with the same? Alyssa says as she sat herself on the bar stool next to Rhea. It's no trouble at all. But apologies, I do only have some leftovers as I wasn't expecting anyone to show up today. Is that acceptable? No problem. Your leftovers will taste delicious nonetheless. You okay with it Alyssa? No. I wouldn't have any problems with them, and I agree that it will taste delicious all the same. Very well, I will begin preparing the food now. Do be patient. Sebastian then leaves through a door carved into the massive the massive artificial tree, which held a kitchen within. I wonder how the others are doing. In the decoy fleet, they should be entering combat by the end of the day. Yes. Alyssa then brought up her datapad and scrolled to the list of deployed equipment and personnel. All active combat personnel and a total of 5 carriers, 9 battleships, 12 cruisers, 15 destroyers and a fleet of small craft have been deployed to participate in the decoy fleet. They are scheduled to attack in about 8 hours to try and draw as much of the dominion of man ships away from the main fleet that we are set to attack tomorrow. Hopefully allowing us an easier time tomorrow. That's good, hopefully, nothing will go wrong tomorrow.
Our contract only states that we need to participate in this battle and once it is over we can relax. Do you have any plans for afterwards? Rhea said as she stretches and leans back in her seat. No, but I do have something to request of you. Oh? That is unusual. What is it? I would like to spend the night with you today. Huh? I don't think a slight blush appearing on her face as she covered her mouth with the back of her hand. No. It's nothing like that. I just want to sleep with you just like the old days. Alyssa flustredly tried to correct herself tonight, but, it should be fine right? One day should be possible. Rhea muttered under her breath, not wanting Alyssa to hear her. Is that a no? Are you busy tonight? Noticing Rhea muttering something under her breath, hesitation and reluctance plastered onto her once cheery face, Alyssa questioned, a tinge of disappointment in her voice. No, no I am not. It's okay. You can sleep over in my room tonight there is nothing wrong. Sensing the disappointment in Alyssa's voice, Rhea readily accepted her request. It's okay if you don't want to. It's understandable. After all, I said it's okay already. Don't be sad. It's not your fault, I was just surprised that's all. Rhea exclaimed in a panic, trying to console Alyssa. Is that so? I will head over later then. Alyssa's face lit up, burying her doubts and anxieties into deep recesses of her heart. Mistress Rhea, Mistress Alyssa, your food is ready. Sebastian informed the two, placing a pair of trays covered with a cloche in front of Rhea and Alyssa. As Sebastian removes the cloche, a heavenly aroma spreads around the room and entered their noses, stimulating their appetite even further. The pair immediately dug into food, the smell was too appetizing to resist. As expected Sebastian, even your leftovers are exquisite. Thank you for the praise, Mistress Alyssa. Sebastian humbly replied, as the two ate their meal. They made small talk with each other. Soon their plates and bowls were empty and their hunger was satiated. That was a good meal. I have business in the washroom, so I will take my leave for the moment. Alyssa says, wiping her mouth with a napkin, before standing up and leaving. Would you like anything to drink? Mistress Rhea. Sebastian offers as he clears the empty trays from Rhea's and Alyssa's meal. Just water will do. I cannot be drinking the day before an important battle. Rhea replies in a monotone voice. Her face devoid of expression. Sebastian takes an empty glass and wipes it down with a cloth before filling it water and placing it in front of her. I am sorry but I happened to overhear your discussion earlier and I have to say Mistress Rhea. It is advisable for you to tell Mistress Alyssa about your condition. It's better if she finds out from your mouth, instead of by herself whether through her own actions or yours. It's fine. She won't find out. I can't let her find out. Rhea says her hands restlessly rubbing against her forearms. Seeing your condition, today should be day of you doing that. But with Mistress Alyssa staying over tonight it shouldn't be possible for you to perform it. His eyes wandering to her restless hands. I can hold for a day. Nothing will go wrong. Myra's meds should be able to take the edge off. If you say so Mistress Rhea. It isn't in my place to interfere after all. But do take care. The medicine provided by Mistress Myra acts like a dam. The water might be blocked but it doesn't mean it stopped accumulating much less disappeared. Anyways, it seems like Mistress Alyssa is returning, we cease this talk immediately, but I have to say, over my countless years of listening to a flurry of patrons from many different walks of life, the fact is that they will always find out, so consider what is important and what you truly want. I will, take note of your advice. As soon Alyssa walks over, the doll-like expressionless face of Rhea was completely gone, replaced with her usual bright self. Did anything happen when I was gone? No, Mistress Rhea and I was just having some small talk. Yeah, Sebastian and I were just talking about the past, nothing much, if you say so. Eyeing the two suspiciously. In any case, I will head back to my quarters first to pick up some stuff. I will see you later Rhea and take care Sebastian. See you later. Rhea waves Alyssa off as Sebastian lightly bows. Mistress Alyssa is quite perceptive. Indeed, she wouldn't be in the position she is in otherwise. Sebastian I will head off. I have to get ready. Do take care, Mistress Rhea and do have a pleasant evening. Without responding, Rhea left the weeping willow and headed to her quarters. 3 A 0 C 3 Broken Reflection Location Captain's Quarters, Planetary Assault Carrier Avalon, 
Numa star system, year, 1500 GSD. Upon returning to her room Raya changed out from her uniform and into more comfortable pajamas which was just a black hoodie. Her room was pretty normal, lightly decorated with a king-sized bed, a wardrobe, a desk with a terminal, a set of sofas facing a hollow television and in a corner of the room a mountain of various stuffed animals. She then collapsed onto the side of the bed, her legs hanging off the edge, her eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. Tell the truth. No, I can't. Myra was fine I needed her help, Sebastian figured it out on his own, but Alyssa, I can't let her, if she does find out, she will, she might, she will what? I don't know but I still won't tell her, I don't know why, but I just can apostrophe t exclamation mark dot 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 when I think about it my chest hurts, why, why, this feeling is familiar, familiar, felt it in the past, long time ago, can't remember, can't remember, what was it, what is important, what I want, commander ear, lieutenant commander Alyssa is requesting access to your quarters, Alyssa, what I want, what is important, right, he he he, ha ha ha, shooting out of her bed Rhea starts maniacally laughing and cackling to herself whilst grabbing the side of her forehead with her hands, right, Alyssa, I want it, I want to hear yours too, ah, what would yours sound like, no, no, I can't, where is it, her ecstatic expression contorts into different weird and awkward faces as she tumbles out of her bed and crawls towards the nearby bedside table. She attempted to pull herself up using the table as a support but instead dragged the entire table down onto its side instead. Ignoring the mess, she opens the lowest most drawer, causing many identical pill bottles to roll out, grabbing a random one haphazardly. She opens the cap and dumps its contents out onto the floor. Picking up two pills she immediately pops them into her mouth and swallows it. Commander Ear. Lieutenant Commander Alyssa is requesting access to your quarters. Celine I know. Inform Lieutenant Commander Alyssa that I am in the washroom and I will allow her in in five minutes. Alyssa. No. It's not enough time. Sebastian was right. I need the stronger faster acting variant no choice. Reaching for the same drawer she popped open the bottom revealing a false compartment, within contained three sets of pneumatic injectors. She grabbed one of the injectors which contained a stronger variant of the medicine in the pill and in a higher dose. She took one injector and released the safety, before placing against her carotid artery and pulling the trigger. After the entire dose was administered she threw the injector aside. The effects of the drug was immediately apparent as her mental status was forcibly suppressed, her mind was hazy, and her thoughts were slow as through they were moving through a vat of molasses. Through the haze shrouding her mind, she remembered that she had to return the room to its normal state. She picked up the remaining pills and returned them to their container, before flipping the bedside table upright, placing back the false bottom and putting the pill bottles back into the drawer. Rhea walked towards a nearby mirror and stared into it, showing her dead eyes and expressionless face. She then began shifting through different cheerful expressions and facial positions. Not this one. This one is too stiff. Ah. This one might work. Oh. This one is perfect. Let's go with this one. R. R. Testing. Testing. All right. This would do. In the mirror a young woman with big bright eyes and an innocent sunny smile staring back at her. Reminder, five minutes is up, do you wish to allow Lieutenant Commander Alyssa into your quarters? Send her in. Affirmative. The mechanical sounds of doors opening could be heard in the distance, after which the rhythmic sound of footsteps could be heard approaching the room's door. As the door opened it revealed the enchanting and mature figure of Alyssa wearing a white dress like an negligee. She carried a pillow in one hand and her data pad in the other. Don't tell me you walked here dressed like that. Our rooms are basically right next to each other, and no one else lives in this section of the ship besides us. Alyssa gave Rhea room a once over and remarked. It's been a while but with exception to that mountain of stuffed animals your room is as bland as ever. It serves its purpose. I can live well enough with everything here. Their purposes are self-explanatory and stuffed animals bring me comfort in stressful times. Rhea shrugged exaggeratedly. Though I mentioned this several times before but this is essentially your home. 
it might not serve much practical use but living in such a dreary place doesn't do well for one's mental health. Decorating the place will allow you to express your feelings into the design and let some of your personality shine through. If I showed this room to any one of our members they wouldn't believe that this dull room belongs to their bright and eccentric commander. If it is about expressing one's feelings and letting their personality show through its decorations then this room fits me perfectly fine. Sigh, cut me some slack would you? I will consider it. I heard that one before. Really this time. I heard that one too. A few seconds pass as both of them stared awkwardly at each other. The tension quickly shattered as they broke out in boisterous laughter. Enough with standing weirdly at the doorway already. Rhea joyfully exclaimed, gesturing for Alyssa to come in. Alyssa entered the room and placed her data pad on the nearby desk and her pillow onto Rhea's bed. Rhea then picked up one of her extra pillows and tossed it aside towards the pile of stuffed animals, knocking a few of them loose. The two then spent the night relaxing and hanging out together. They watched videos and movies on the couch and ate snacks that Rhea had stashed in her wardrobe. After they were done watching videos they chatted with each other about various meaningless topics and before long it was time to go to bed, for they have a long and arduous battle ahead. They turned off the lights before tucking themselves into bed, facing each other. When was the last time we did this? It has already been 22 years since we first met. Time surely flies, though looking at you one certainly couldn't tell. Facing away from Rhea, Alyssa looked at the ceiling reminiscing on her past. I was but eight years old then and the kingdom was embroiled in a civil war at that time. On that day, I was accompanying my parents on a diplomatic visit but en route due to a traitor within our ranks. We were ambushed, it was a mess, and within the chaos I was kidnapped. I was locked in a dark cell for months, they used me as a deterrent to prevent my parents from attacking them directly. Alyssa then turns back towards Rhea, until that day, I heard sounds of fighting outside my cell and then silence. The cell door opened at first I thought that it was over and the rebels had come to kill me, but then I felt a warm embrace. It was you. You told me you were going to protect me and keep me safe forever. You were just like those heroes that came to save the kidnapped princess from old literature. You fought your way out of the base and once out you met the kingdom's army and returned me home. But, Alyssa told Tell with sparkles and wonder in her eyes, but towards the end her eyes grew sad. You were my hero, and yet a few months later I heard that you disappeared and were declared dead. I couldn't believe it. I pleaded with my parents to launch an investigation but even though they were quick to accept my pleas, nothing came out of the investigation. Alyssa the shuffled closer towards Rhea and hugged her, pressing her head against Rhea's modest chest. I was so happy when I found out that you returned. I quickly tried to arrange a meeting with you but you rejected it at first. I must have sounded like one of the many factions trying to cajole you into joining them back then. But when I finally got to meet you. You looked no different from the day you saved me. It's as if your time was stopped in the past and everyone else had a moved on without you. Alyssa then looked upwards towards Rhea's face and asked, Hey, can you tell me what happened 22 years ago? What happened during your disappearance? I, I, I'm sorry but I don't wish to discuss what happened during those times. Not yet at least. I see. That's fine. I don't know what you went through during those times but what matters is that you managed to come back, is that what happened before I disappeared? I can barely recall the memories and feelings from back then, I vaguely remember something it happening that way, but I am unsure, managed to come back, is that really true? It doesn't feel like it, feel, were it only so? Alright, that's enough heavy talk, it really has been so long since we slept like this though it was quite different from back then, maybe not actually. You slept with me like this, though our sizes have reversed. I used to be able to fit snuggly within your arms, but now I have grown so much and you remained as short as ever. Alyssa readjusted her position so that they were facing each other. Hey, I am not that short. You might be two heads taller than me but it's not that bad. Right, right, 155 centimeters is average. Alyssa comforted softly patting her hand. You are making fun of me aren't you? Rhea acutely pouted. Maybe. But in any case, we really should be sleeping now. Good night Rhea. Sigh. Good night Alyssa. 
The two girls soon fell asleep in each other's embrace, their slow rhythmic breathing softly reverberating through the room. Should they win the next battle, the war with the dominion of man would be essentially be over. However, little would they know that this would be the last peaceful night they can spend together like this in a long time to come. Opening her weary eyes, Rhea found herself standing in the middle of nothingness, a pitch black blank space, an abyss of emptiness, where time ceased to be, where life ceased to exist, a world abandoned by even death itself. She looked down at her hands, seeing nothing but a fuzzy white outline indicating the boundaries of her hands but with nothing in between. Like a 2D drawing where the artist did not color or fill in the details of the subject he was drawing similar to that of a rough sketch. Ah, I am back here, to this world without hopes and dreams, a world without compassion and love, where desires reign supreme, a wasteland of despair, anguish and resignation, where the strings of fate are severed. I have not dreamed of this place in a while, the talk with Alyssa must have brought my mind back here once again. Those things should be here then. But, as she looked around she struggled to find what she was looking for. Something is different, where are they? The spirits. And what are those pillars? They weren't there before. This isn't how I remembered this place looked like. Sensing someone behind her ear turned round and took a huge leap backwards, creating space between them. She was then able to see the figure that had stealthily crept up behind her. It was draped in a cloak of shadows a pair of bright yellow eyes bearing down at her through the mist as it stood there unmoving, their hands placed on the pommel of a blade stabbed into the ground. It's you, what are you doing here in my dreams? No, why am I back here in this forsaken world? The time of reckoning hath come, soon you shall stand on the precipice, the crossroads of fate shall be laid bare to you, you must find it, do not make a ominous yet benevolent voice boom from the entity. What is it? What are you saying? I can't say more. It's not yet time. I have intervened too much already. It will notice. What is this it you are referring to? Do not attempt to investigate it. You are not ready. It will notice you. Crack crack. It seems that this place cannot hold any longer. How fleeting our time has been. Suddenly the space surrounding the two of them began to crack shattering like a glass dome as chunks of glass started to rain from the sky showering atop the two of them. A black mist then crashed through the area like rough waves against the rocky shoreline, blanketing the area with its presence. Rhea raised her arms up in front of her, bracing herself against the oncoming mist. She staggered forward against the billowing mist that was gradually gaining strength, trying to make her way towards where she last saw the entity. She struggled forward with leaden steps through what can now be described as a massive hurricane, as the wind speeds rapidly increased, each step she took threatened to blow her off her feet, she soon was catch a glimpse of the entity through the gaps in her arms as it slowly faded into the surging mist as if being absorbed before it fully disappeared, the entity left its final words for ear. when the time comes. Do not regret your choices and keep marching onwards, though you may have forgotten, try to grasp it once again and once you do, we will certainly meet again. A blinding light enveloped Rhea's vision and she found herself awake, back in her bed aboard the Avalon. Rhea you are awake, did I accidentally wake you? I wanted to let you sleep slightly longer but it seems I have awoken you instead, I am sorry, right. I slept with Alyssa last night, the dream though what was it about? Was it really a dream? And that entity why does it always have to be so cryptic, back then and even now, I don't feel like it is trying to trick me. This confusing. I should probably should worry about it later when I have time, there is something more important right around the corner, I have to focus on that first. Hello, Rhea are you awake? Snapping out her thoughts, Rhea saw Alyssa crouching over her pinning her to the bed their faces right next to each other. I kept calling for you but you weren't responding, seems like you were lost in thought. Alyssa then got off the bed, already changed out of her pajamas and fully dressed. As I was saying, I will head out to get some breakfast first. I have to read up on that list you gave me yesterday too. I will see you on the bridge later in two hours, before we are set to move off. All right then, I will see you later. Rhea smiled and waved Alyssa off. As soon as Alyssa left her quarters, 
Rhea got out of bed and went to the washroom to have a quick shower. After undressing herself, she entered the shower and turned on the water. A frigid shower of cold water flowed out of the shower head onto her face and onto her back. Rhea stood in that position for a while, letting the cold waters wake her up and allowing her to sort out the events of last night. I still can't think of anything that would relate to its words. It could be the battle ahead but I feel like it was referring to something grander, something that I have no knowledge of at the moment. It said I was standing at the precipice so it's warning me that something dangerous might occur soon. I should take extra caution then. Even if nothing comes to pass, extra precautions wouldn't hurt. After compiling her thoughts she finished up washing her body and hair with soap and conditioner before drying off and wrapping a towel around her body. After leaving the washroom she changed into her uniform and went towards the bed table. Opening the second drawer she pocketed the bottle of pills we she opened last night and took the remaining two pneumatic injectors and holstered onto her thigh belt. One of the injectors contained the same drug that she took yesterday while the other one contained a drug that she would use a last resort. After grabbing everything she needed, she exited her room and entered a door directly opposite her room. Her personal armory inside from wall to wall was racks containing various firearms ranging from rifles to snipers to handguns and even shotguns, with different that models that shot a variety of ammunition such as regular bullets, plasma, laser and even weapons that could tear the molecules off their targets, the particle disruptors, crudely strewn about the floor was piles of ammunition in their cases and various types of grenades, in the center wall stood a lone item, a simple looking bracelet unlike everything else in the room. Rhea walked up towards the bracelet and gently took it of its stand, caressing it slowly as it was her most precious thing in the world. It's been a while partner, you haven't feasted lately, your time might come soon. After putting on the bracelet, she grabbed three particle disruptors, kinetic handguns and portable shield generators. She grabbed a handful of disintegration grenades a type of grenade that explosion will literally disintegrate all targets and objects in a spherical radius when detonated. After grabbing the equipment she needed she left the armory and headed towards the Weeping Willow. After entering the Weeping Willow she quickly made her way to the bar and placed a particle disruptor, handgun and portable shield generator on the countertop. Good morning to you Mistress Rhea but I would like patrons to keep the bar top free from personal effects as much as possible. Sebastian greeted, eyeing the veritable armory placed onto the bar top, just a safety precaution from my personal armory, normally there will be guards patrolling but there isn't today, so keep this on you just in case. Are you expecting something to happen Mistress Rhea, but I dare say that it would be highly improbable for intruders to damage this vessel much less board it, as I said just a safety precaution. Don't misconstrued my intentions it will just be inconvenient if something were to happen to you that's all. Very well Mistress Rhea, if you insist, but aside from delivering weapons here, how about some breakfast to start of your day, one can't fight on an empty stomach after all. That, would be appreciated. After finishing her meal, Rhea quickly left the weeping willow and made her way to the bridge. When Rhea entered the bridge she spotted Alyssa already there standing next to the observation windows looking out at the gathered coalition fleet. Hearing the bridge doors opening, Alyssa turned around, glancing towards the weapons that Rhea was carrying. A melancholic look on her face. Good morning Rhea. Did you have breakfast already? Yeah. I went to Sebastian's it was delicious as usual. I am good to go for the battle ahead. You okay? You don't look too well. Maybe you should got to medical for a checkup. I am fine. Brushing her hair back behind her ears. It's just the normal jitters before a battle nothing much. Most people won't be so relaxed like you before such a major operation. Though I would like to ask why you have brought weapons here. It's good that you are alright. Here take this, just in case something happens. Passing over the same loadout that she gave Sebastian to Alyssa. I don't think anything will happen, but one can't be too careful you know. It's clear you think something might happen. You have never done this before. Alyssa remarked equipping the gear handed over to her, trusting Rhea's instincts. Yeah, I have a bad omen about this upcoming battle. Though I have no solid evidence and I am relying purely on my guttural feelings, 
If anything does happen, stay here and coordinate the battle, you are well experienced with fleet to battles but not anti-personnel combat correct? That is true but. Before Alyssa could finish her sentence, Rio approached her and gently brought Alyssa head into an embrace. No buts, okay? I trust you to run the ship if anything happens, you are trusted adjutant after all. Can I count on you? I promise I won't disappear like last time. Rhea whispered gently to Alyssa, her head pressed against Rhea's chest. You can hear my heartbeats can't you? I am not worried at all. So put your trust in me just like I put my trust in you. Rhea reassures Alyssa, gently brushing her fingers through Alyssa's silky blonde hair. Okay Rhea, I trust you. You know Alyssa hesitated to finish her sentence. I, alert, incoming transmission from Coalition Command. Celine's alert interrupted Alyssa before she could finish, causing a disappointed sigh to escape her lips. I know what you wanted to say Alyssa, but I, I can't reciprocate those pure feelings of yours. I, don't know what it feels like to love anymore. I hope you find someone else one day. I am not worth it, not worth fixing. Patch us through. Rio and Alyssa took their positions and in their respective seats around the Holitable. The Holitable then lit up, projecting the same faces from the day before. Let's not waste time. Around four hours ago, I got word from the decoy fleet that they have been engaged by enemy reinforcements. It seems a sizable chunk of the main fleet has detached and has left to render aid. The is right, our fleets are in position and thus we should move of right away. Admiral Zecht's informed, upon receiving news of the success of the decoy fleet, the members quickly agreed to the Admiral Zecht's proposal to depart immediately, as was the plan all along. They all left the meeting in order to inform the fleets under their command of their decision. They would then send an acknowledgement once they are ready to depart. Well that was short and sweet. We have nothing left to do but wait now I suppose. Alyssa can you send the signal that we are ready? Already done commander. All right, now we wait. What do you think they are doing right now? It shouldn't take long to inform their ships to move off right? They are probably giving a rousing speech fleet to their troops in order to boost morale. Something along the lines of honor and valor, or maybe even how if they fail today that the Dominion would destroy and conquer their homes slaughter their families. Four eyes probably won't say much I bet, maybe entice his troops with profits and benefits. Should I give a speech to? Who would you even give it to? There is no one here at the moment. You, there, there is no need. You already done so earlier. Alyssa stammers as she blushes heavily from Rhea's words. You are so cute, when you act like that. Though I am glad you no longer nervous anymore. You might not have noticed but your fingers have been pretty restless earlier. Rhea beamed at her. Surprised by that fact, Alyssa looked down at her hands and saw that they were calm and steady. She knew she had a habit of rubbing her fingernails against each other when she was nervous. Thank you Rhea. Rhea simply smiled in response to a 0C4 decisive battle. Location, Bridge, Planetary Assault Carrier Avalon, Numa Star System, Year. 1500 GSD. Commander, confirmed green light from all parties, we are ready to move off. Very well, synchronize our warp drives to the fleet, increase core output to 80%, Avalon entering combat status. The core of a ship was a miniature black hole house in a massive containment unit, using the Penrose process to generate energy for the entire ship, as long as the core of the ship was online. It could generate an almost indefinite amount of energy. As the core's output was increased more negative energy was being pumped into the black hole thereby increasing its energy output. The ship's weapon system came online as they were released from their housings all across the ship's hull. Particle destabilizers which was the anti-capital ship version of the particle disruptor. Dark matter launchers able to effectively destroy the shields of enemy ships. M railguns that used electromagnetic energy to propel a solid projectile through the hulls of enemy ships. Reactive antimatter ship torpedoes and fusion missiles were loading into their launches. Kinetic flak and laser flak weapons came online. They were the ship's point defense weapons used to shoot down enemy small craft and incoming torpedoes or missiles. Within the ship's hangars, interceptors and bombers were being loaded onto the numerous gravity catapults in the hangars. 
the weapon systems were being managed by the ships on board a Iseline, which will aim and fire the various weaponry housed on the Avalon based on orders from Rhea. A second A Elisha controlled the fleet of automated craft that would be launched from the Avalon's hangars. The third A I Eres handled the Avalon's maneuverability and power systems. The fourth and final A Ionina handled planetary assault and the control of ground forces. But when the Avalon was engaged in fleet combat, Inanna will assist the other A.I.S. In their tasks and handle any boarding actions. When out of combat, the four AI usually spent their time managing the ship's various other functions and perform maintenance on their respective systems, rarely bothering the crew unless needed. Good morning, Rhea. Alyssa, warp systems are online and synchronized with the fleet. We can get going whenever the fleet is ready, Eres reported, appearing on top of the holitable a bright smile plastered on her face. Eres' personality was similar to that of a child, pure and innocent. She was the youngest of the four AI and was like a younger sister to the other three. Similar to her personality her model was that of a small child, she had fluffy light pink hair pink eyes and a pair of white bear ears. She wore a white button-down shirt with a light pinkish tie front shawl, a pink skirt, fur boots. Her hands hugging a white polar bear plushie with a red bow on its head. Commander ear, weapon systems are online and operational. Ammunition levels at max capacity. Another AI appeared on top of the holitable reading a book in her hand. Celine. She had a bit of monotone voice and preferred the quiet company of books. She wore a black blazer over a white collared shirt, black half-rimmed glasses, a red ribbon tied under the collar, black skirt that ended slightly above the knees, knee-high socks and black shoes, reminiscent of a teenage schoolgirl. She had light brown hair tied into a long ponytail and yellow eyes. Yawn. Good morning everyone. All gravity catapults are online and the drones have been attached to them. Just waiting for you to pull the trigger, I am going back to sleep. Wake me up, when the world ends. The sleepy AI was Elisha. She enjoyed playing games and can see in sleeping most of the times, though she does perform her job well when needed. She had lilac colored hair with cat ears and sapphire colored eyes. She wore a light blue hoodie that covered up to her upper thighs and her legs and feet were bare. She held a portable game console in her right hand as she was collapsed face first over a fluffy pillow. Well, I am same as usual, nothing much. Planetary assault systems are offline and mechanized soldiers are armed and on standby. Sigh, once again I have nothing to do. Inanna was a slightly jaded AI, for the fact she is almost never able to perform her primary duties as they were few and far between. Within the five years that Rhea was in command she was only ever able to perform her primary role twice. She had long flowing light green hair and jade green eyes. She wore a gothic Lolita dress, with a black lacy parasol usually in her hands. She was currently sitting down on a chair in front of a table whilst sipping a cup of tea. Seems like your girls are having fine day, Alyssa what is the status of the warp? The fleet has begun to spool up their warp drives. We will be warping out shortly. Erez, you should have received the data, we will leave the timing to you. Leave it to me. Shiro help me activate the warp drives, jumping in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, let's go. Erez happily jumped, tossing Shiro the polar bear into the air. The Avalon entered warp space at the moment along with the rest coalition fleet, disappearing for the Numa star system. The Avalon's warp speed was intentionally reduced so as to not stray ahead of the fleet, matching the speed of the slowest vessel in the fleet. If the Avalon was allowed to head to its destination at full speed, it will only take a minute. Nice work Erez. Rhea complimented as she used hands to pat Erez's virtual head. A he, we should arrive in 10 minutes. Alyssa anything on the sensors? Nothing yet. We are entering a star system with an active neutron star. Its magnetic field is affecting the accuracy of the data, even with our advanced sensor suite. We should get more accurate readings as we get closer. Okay, keep an eye out on the scanners. Alert me if you notice anything suspicious. 
Speaking of suspicious I am getting a weird reading. It's pretty weak at the moment but it could just be interference from the neutron star and is nothing important. Here I will display it on the Holitable. Alyssa interacted with the Holitable and displayed the data of their destination star system. Look here. This is the neutron star and this is the detected gravitational waves, but over here the gravitational waves just disappear. This entire area isn't affected by the gravitational pull of the neutron star. Hearing the conversation, Elisha woke up from her sleep, and looked at the projection of the star system. Zero point energy, can negate the effects of gravity. You can use it to create an anti-gravitational field. Something in that zone contains a massive amount of zero-point energy. Zero-point energy? Mega structure, massive zero-point energy source. It can't be. Alyssa, is there any remnant space quakes at our destination? Hurry. Space quakes? As in the residual traces of warping? Hold on a second let me see. Alyssa scoured the data from sensors. Yes there is a signs of space quakes in the area. Why? A detached force left the main fleet to attack the decoy fleet. Wouldn't signs of space quakes be expected? That was close to five hours ago. There wouldn't be any signs of space quakes anymore at this point. Inanna interjected. Based on the size and amount of space quakes a massive amount of ships must have left the area. This is an important strategic point for the dominion of man. They won't abandon this place. Selene added on. We have been had. Rhea exclaimed. Rhea reached under the holitable and pressed a button hidden below without hesitation. With the push of the button, alarms started blaring and red warning lights activated across the entire ship. Impossible. Is it finally my turn? Alyssa, can you contact the coalition fleet? Tell them that we are walking into a trap and to expect close quarters combat. I can't get through. Something is interfering with comms. Ignore it then. Get ready for boarding actions, as discussed earlier. You take control of the fleet combat. Don't worry Selene, Elis and Erez will be here to help you. Inanna, deploy the mechanized soldiers to critical combat sectors. I leave the distribution to you, afterwards get into your avatar and head over to the Weeping Willow. Meet up with Sebastian and explain the situation to him. Go now, he he, it's finally my time so I won't disappoint. I will live up to your trust. I will manage the situation here on the bridge. Rhea nodded and quickly left the bridge. Alyssa, egress in 10 seconds. The Avalon and the coalition forces warped out into the Kailosh star system and was greeted by the sight of a large mega structure. It was a massive structure consisting of multiple interlocking rings moving around in a set pattern around a mass of black and white energy. The mass of energy had an accretion disk and a distorted space time around it. There was not a single Dominion ship in sight. This signature, Rhea this is Alyssa, I have confirmed the presence of the layered singularity core. What should I do? Alyssa informed Alyssa over Avalon's internal communication system. As I suspected, try to destroy it if possible. Otherwise attempt to contact Coalition Command and have the entire fleet retreat. Understood. A low hum could be heard as the fabric of space began trembling. The energy levels of the singularity core started rising rapidly and then silence. A pulse of energy propagated through the entire star system at faster than light speeds. As soon as the pulse hit the coalition ships, their shields and power cores got disabled, leaving them immobile and vulnerable to attack. A shock wave rippled through the Avalon as the energy pulse swept across the entire ship. A wah wah wah, Penro's core has been shut down. Activating emergency Google Blitz generators, diverting power to maintain Penrose containment vessel, this is bad. Shearer cannot get the engines working from here, the repair drones have been disabled. Not, only that I am detecting warp signatures separate from our own, it's right on top of us, as if on command, Dominion ships began warping in right into the center of the coalition's formation. Their weapons immediately firing upon the coalition ships inflicting catastrophic damage due to shields being disabled and with them being immobilized they couldn't even attempt to evade. It didn't take long for the coalition ships to retaliate. However, the Dominion warped in with small mobile destroyers allowing them to evade attacks and with them being scattered in the center of the coalition's formation, the coalition ships hesitated to fire their weapons, weary of friendly fire. As the Dominion destroyers distracted the coalition ships, 
a second wave of ships warped in. These ships were even smaller than the destroyers but were even more mobile. Instead of firing upon the coalition, these ships quickly picked up speed and set a collision course into nearby ships. As they impacted the hull of the coalition ships, they easily pierced through the hulls without damage due to the thick armor and shock absorbent material that lined them. As they embedded themselves into the coalition's ships, they released their payload of Dominion Marines. Their job to quickly board the ship and take out the crew or to disable important systems. The Avalon was no exception, receiving the brunt of the attacks, sending shock waves throughout the ships. The hull of the Avalon made from a special composite nanomaterial was effective in negating most of the weapons from conventional weaponry. However, it was far from invincible. The concentrated fire weakened the hull enough giving the opportunity for the boarding parties to enter. Have our point defense focus on the boarding crafts, ignore everything else unless it is antimatter torpedo on it, but there is too many of them, where are they coming from? Elis, scramble all remaining fighters, same target priority as Selene. I am trying, that hit from the enemy super weep and disabled the gravity catapults. I have gotten 70% of them restarted currently and they are already launching fighters. Where is this communication scrambling coming from? If it's from the Singularity Core that would be a huge problem. Erez, how goes the shields and engines? Can we start them up again? Ito, I still can't do anything from here, but I messaged Rhea to head to the locations I marked to restart the systems. The Avalon's weapons lit up the darkness of space. Particle destabilizers rip the Dominion ships apart with ease. A single shot tearing their hulls apart at a molecular level, destroying them instantly. Kinetic rounds punch through their hulls, hitting vital areas of the ship with ease and precision, disabling the ship. Dark matter launchers ripping apart shields with ease and melting through the hulls o ships. Point defense fire, shot down waves torpedoes and boarding crafts approaching the Avalon. The point defense are getting overwhelmed, there is simply not enough time to shoot the boarding craft down, they are warping in way too close, they are getting through, all hands get ready for combat, incoming boarding parties. Alyssa alerted through the ship's broadcast system. Hull breaches across the ship, the hull breaches from the boarding craft are being sealed as they are made, so there shouldn't be any danger of atmospheric loss. Ignore them, let Ryu and Inanna handle them. We still have our jobs to do. Alyssa, I found something. The source of the signal, Erez happily exclaimed, bringing up an image of the jamming source on the holitable. A Luna Corporation. Vessel? No, it doesn't match any of their ships, and it's though its IFF signal is correct on the surface there is an additional layer within it to alert Dominion ships of its location. Selene. I know. A particle destabilizer rotated its turret and aimed directly at the disguised Dominion vessel. A flashlight was produced as it fired upon the ship, the concentrated energy beam swept slowly across the ship, bisecting it into two. A large explosion soon followed as its reactor core was destroyed, sending a chain reaction of explosions across the entire ship. A flurry of communications soon flooded the open channel, requests for assistance status reports and leadership who attempting to give orders incoming communication request from kingdom of epra flagship krasvlg put them through commander ear what's your status general alicia's voice rang through the communicator command ria is not here she has gone to defend the ship from the raiding parties Alyssa, our fleet is crippled we are trying to restart the reactors but it will take some time we have lost around 40% of our ships and I assume that is true for the others too. We have intruders on board but we have been able to hold them off for now. What is that super weapon? It's something Rhea calls the Alyssa get down. The 3 a .I apostrophe s cried out. An explosion soon ripped through the area as a boarding craft crashed into the bridge, knocking Alyssa off her feet and away from the holitable. The hull of the Avalon immediately reacted as nanomaterial quickly grew from the intact hull and sealed the breach around the boarding craft. Alyssa now on the ground started to breathe heavily as the air in her lungs were knocked out of her from the shock wave. She grabbed the holitable, struggling to stand up with its support as her vision was spinning and her ears ringing. As her peeked past the holitable as she was standing up, she saw Dominion Marines filing out of the boarding ship. 
her survival instincts kicked in, as she immediately dropped her body to the ground behind the holitable as a slew of gunfire ripped through the space her head was just at. The Dominion forces quickly suppressed the area around the holitable with gunfire as they slowly pushed up. In retaliation, auto turrets dropped down from the bridge's ceiling and opened fire on the invading forces, stopping the push in its tracks. The Dominion forces reactively deployed portable shields, providing them with cover from the auto turrets. Both parties now pinned down on opposite sides of the bridge. Alyssa's vision and hearing soon returned to normal and she was able to hear General Aisha calling out to her through the communicator. Alyssa, Alyssa, respond. I am fine. A boarding party breached the bride. I am taking fire but unharmed for now. Alyssa reported. She began looking around for her particle disruptor that she had leaned against the holitable earlier and found it laying out in the open, knocked away from the table due to the explosion, as she was about to leave cover in order to attempt to grab the weapon. She was quickly stopped by Elis. Whoa, stop, stop. What are you doing? The energy burst from the Singularity core knocked out the ship's shields earlier. Your portable shield generator ain't surviving that. Hearing Elis's words. She checked her shield generator and sure enough it was disabled. Her inexperience in the field rearing its ugly head as she almost got herself killed as soon as the battle started. She still had her handgun that was still holstered around her thigh but compared to the particle disruptor its firepower was lacking. Damn. I almost got myself killed instantly. If Rhea hadn't stopped me from following her earlier. I would just be a burden in a firefight. I am so useless, even if I wasn't on the bridge I am sure Selene, Elis and Eras could handle the fleet battle themselves. I am just not. Alyssa, stop mopping around in the middle of combat. If you want to contemplate your life decisions do it after we are in the clear. Alyssa, cheer up okay? I don't know much about what you are feeling but you are not useless. So cheer up and let's get through this fight together, okay? Eras comforted Alyssa, giving her a bright reassuring smile. I have to agree, we could hear you muttering to yourself earlier. You shouldn't be comparing yourself to us, though we might act this way. We are still artificial intelligences created for combat situations. Our abilities in our field will naturally overshadow that of humans. Yet there are still many things we cannot do. If you want to improve yourself. We will be glad to help but now is hardly the time for that. I do not know what is happening over there but from what I can hear the a.i.s. Over there are correct Alyssa. I know your feelings, but there is a time and place for these things. Alicia chided in through the communicator. I am a sorry and thank you. After getting a pep talk, Alyssa refocuses her priorities and drew her pistol from its holster and started firing back at the Dominion forces. The auto turrets managed to thin out the Dominion's numbers, but as they were unshielded they were beginning to fall. Their suppression on the Dominion slowly losing effectiveness. Alyssa what were you going to say earlier? Alyssa then tells Alicia the details of the lead singularity core that Rhea gave her earlier as she occasionally peeks out from cover, firing a few rounds at the Dominion forces, before ducking back in cover before the Dominion could shoot back. Occasionally her shots would connect taking down an enemy soldier. She was unable to use her grenades as there were many sensitive equipment and connections in the bridge nor did not want to cause another hull breach. I won't deny that I am upset that this information was hidden from us but I understand Rhea's decision, but we are unable to assist with this matter seal those bulkheads on deck 7, reposition our forces towards the reactor. Our forces are occupied dealing with the boarding parties and Dominion ships. Even if we were available we are currently out of weapons range and kinetic weapons will take too long to reach the target. You could try the others, but I am sure their answers will be the same. All right, we will figure something out on our end. Sorry, we can't do much. Alicia out. The communication from the Hrasvugras are disconnected. Selene is our main gun available for tasking. Negative, it would need the Penrose core to be fully online if we wanted to fire it, according to Inanna. Ryu is already making her way to the core. All right, once the Penrose core is up and running fire it upon. Clink. Turning to the cause of the sound, Alyssa's perception of time immediately slows to a crawl. A round spherical object rolls slowly on the ground besides her. Without thinking, 
she dropped her handgun and lunged towards the object. In this world of slowed time, she could vaguely hear the three A.I.S. calling out to her but she ignored their shouts. Upon grabbing hold the object she threw it back towards the Dominion forces. 2. A0C5 Battle Aboard the Avalon Location, The Hub, Planetary Assault Carrier Avalon, Numa Star System Year, 1500 GSD 10 minutes after combat initiation Lining up the scope with the heads of the soldiers, I pulled the trigger, a short burst of light exited the barrel of my particle disruptor leaving nothing but a bloody mist where they stood. One, two, three, with each pull of the trigger, another life was taken, after more than a dozen I stopped counting, yet I felt nothing. These people had hopes, dreams, aspirations, family, loved ones, unlike me, yet I mercilessly reaped their lives. Their mistake was coming here. Rhea, I got word from Ires that she cannot get the Koran engines restarted remotely and the repair drones are offline. We need to head there personally to restart the systems. However scans indicated that there are clusters of enemies near these sections. Inanna reported, she was currently in her avatar, a physical body that was made in the image of her virtual model. Inanna you head to the engine room and get it online. Sebastian take a team of combat droids and head to the shield generators. Inanna leave a squad of combat droids here and cover the entrance to the bridge. They should not be able to get in but if Alyssa comes through here for whatever reason have those droids cover her. Rhea ordered as she continuously fired at the enemy soldiers. The three of them were bunkered down in the hub behind the couple of pillars, with two squads of eight combat droids supporting them. They had been exchanging fire with waves of Dominion troops for close to five minutes now, hails of lasers and bullets whizzing by as they hid behind cover. The combat droids stood in the open soaking shot after shot, too big to fit behind cover. We need to break through. Our objectives all lay behind those enemy forces. In an deal with them, the rest of us will cover you. Understood. As soon as the Dominion's suppressive fire temporarily died down for them to reload, Ryu and Sebastian took out a disintegration each and threw them towards the right and left of the Dominion's battle line. The grenades rolled on the floor before detonating shortly after, a shrill sound reverberated through the area as a solid red sphere expanded from the grenade with a radius of around 10 meters completely vaporizing everything within. With that as the signal, Inanna dashed forward at top speed, the grenade's lingering solid red sphere of destruction blocking the Dominion Force's line of sight. As soon as she got close enough, she leapt up into the air just as the grenade's lingering explosion faded away. The Dominion Force is none the wiser to her approach. Inanna then gracefully landed in the middle of the Dominion's formation her arms outstretched with a high-capacity machine gun in each hand firing haphazardly in all directions as she gracefully spun in circles on her feet. Bullets flew everywhere causing sparks as they hit the reinforced walls of the Avalon ricocheting in random directions causing further damage, and some eventually finding their mark. After emptying her magazines she stopped her momentum before flourishing her dress, the Dominion soldiers now riddled with countless bullet holes across their entire body, brain matter was splattered against the pristine walls of the Avalon, guts and organs spilling out of massive holes made in their body, the now lifeless corpses of the Dominion soldiers collapsing into a crimson pool of their own flesh and blood. Come the way forward is clear, we should head to our objectives without delay. Have a safe trip. Inanna then walked off towards the hallway leading towards the engine room. As an artificial intelligence in a custom-built combat avatar standing at around 180 centimeters in height, Inanna had superior physical and mental parameters to that of regular humans. Her skin was made of a durable yet flexible synthetic fiber making her skin indistinguishable from that of a regular person's while having higher resistance to penetration. Her frame was made of very light and durable composite metal alloy, allowing her to quickly move about the battlefield while being able to sustain high amounts of damage. As a artificial intelligence she is able to process tons of information quickly and have lightning fast reaction speeds. Goodness. She sure does love leaving a massive mess to clean up. Anyways, Mistress Rhea do take care of yourself. After performing a light bow, 
Sebastian left for the shield generators with a squad of combat droids trailing behind him. While his increasing age has started to catch up to him, Sebastian was once the personal butler and bodyguard for royal family of Ypres. When Alyssa joined Avalon Sebastian, King Alan sent him along with Alyssa to watch over her. Though his body was no longer in his prime, his combat skills were still top-notch and with the assistance of the combat droids, simple rank-and-file soldiers would hardly afford him a challenge. With the other two leaving for their respective objectives, Rhea walked through the carnage in an air caused, her heels quietly splashing on the blood-soaked floor, squashing pieces of guts, organs and brain matter scattered about as she made weight towards the quorum when suddenly the bracelet she wore started vibrating and releasing a sinister misty purple glow. Calm down. There's nothing here for you. Soon, soon Rhea talked to no one in particular as clutching the bracelet in her hands. Sprinting down the winding hallways of the Avalon, Rhea encountered traces of battle throughout. Corpses of Dominion soldiers along with destroyed auto turrets and wreckages of combat droids, as she made her way closer towards the quorum. The traces of battle intensified and became more frequent, as she was about to turn the corner to reach the door leading directly into the quorum, she heard movement voices ahead, she immediately stopped her advance and stood flush against the wall, peeking around the corner to check the situation ahead. What is this fucking door made of? We used up our entire supply of explosives and not even a fucking dent, a soldier exclaimed, giving the door a kick. Find a way to get through. There is are a couple of squads on the opposite side trying to get break the door down from their side, they say that the reactor room is on the opposite side, they are actively trying to sabotage it. But they haven't gotten back to me yet, Alan how's the plasma cutter? Sigh, no luck commander, not even a single scratch, the engineer says disappointedly. Damn, that advisor of the emperor, whatever his name was, creating that stupid super weapon. Spending so much on it and all it does was disable the enemy ships, what did he call it? Altar of Ascension or something? What the hell was the point of sending us here with specially designed ships if you aren't gonna give us equipment to do anything in here? We are just stuck in enemy territory with no way out, let's just do our job, it's not like we can do anything else, I want to see my wife and kids again. The commander bemoaned, yeah, my mother must be worried sick and I was gonna propose but I got drafted to fight in this damned war. What, Daniels? When did you get a girlfriend? One of the soldiers exclaimed. Ah, it's a childhood friend of mine, we know each other since we were five, Daniels sheepishly said, scratching his head. I don't think I can get any more information from them, but this emperor's advisor, Altar of Ascension must be their name for the layered singularity core to be able to create that and ships designed to pierce Avalon's hull, who is he? I will save it for later, I need to. Gah, not now, Rhea dropped her particle disruptor on the ground, clutching her head in pain. Who's there? The commander yelled out, the Dominion squad now in high alert. Ah, the suppressants from yesterday is expiring, I, I, I can't hold it back, Rhea clutched her head in pain, as her sense of reason started to erode a thick haze clouding her mind. Her heartbeat accelerated as her blood boiled, rushing straight towards her head. Her body heated up, beads of sweat forming on her skin as a wave of arousal spread through her body from head to toe. He he he, it's been a while, it wouldn't hurt, it's been a while after all. It will be fine, just, once, let thy bells toll, hearken to thy name, the wicked shalt by delivered, let us revel in this moment. Jaha let the sinners drown in eternal torment. As the soon as the chant was complete, the bracelet on Rhea's wrist shattered into wisps of black flame. A long black dress with a veil manifested, overwriting her uniform. The dress covered her entire body, flowing onto the ground, the trailing end a purple shadowy flame. Long gloves formed on her left arm covered all the way till above her elbows, a thorny black vine coiling tightly around her right arm all the way to her shoulders digging deep into her skin, drawing blood, a scythe with a curved abyssal black snath, a black purplish blade coated in a thin layer of ominous purple flames and a lantern cage with a ball of sinister purple fire within it, scattering butterflies of various colors hung at the top of the scythe. How long has it been, 
Now, let's enjoy this dance, shall we? Snap. With a snap of her fingers, darkness enveloped the hallways and the adjacent rooms, the lights were still on but were unable to penetrate deep into the darkness. An ominous bone chilling mist began rolling along the floor, the ambient temperature rapidly dropping throughout the affected area. With each breath of the freezing air the Dominion soldiers took a sharp piercing pain permeated through their chest and with each breath exhaled a frosty mist was released. They could also hear the slow quiet sounds bells jingling within the darkness, but they could not determine the distance or direction it was originating from, as if it was right beside them. Cold sweat began dripping from their foreheads. The sinister atmosphere affecting them mentally, their heart ray tracing. Rhea sauntered out of the corner, the light from Jaina and her dress dimly illuminating her figure. Each footstep of hers leaving a wisp blue fire in its wake. She stood in the middle of the hallway menacingly, unmoving waiting for the Dominion to make the first move. The sounds of bells also ceased, a silent tension forming between the two parties as they stared each other down. Enemy contact, fire. The Dominion commander shouted, their rifles roared to life, the brief muscle flashes in between each shot lighting up a small area around them, Rhea dashed forward, the sounds of the bells hastening to match her rhythm, countless sparks flashed around her as she twirled her scythe around as she rotated her body, cutting down and deflecting the bullets away mid-air, she leapt into the air, disappearing within a swarm of butterflies before reappearing right in front her first prey. Shit. The last thing he saw was the vicious and sadistic grin on Rhea's face right before his consciousness was severed. With a flash of her scythe, the man was bisected vertically, blood splattered towards Rhea staining her face a crimson red, as the man's life was snuffed out with Jaina. A torrent of mind-breaking pleasure and ecstasy flooded her brain greater than any drug or sexual act could provide, sending her over the edge instantly and with it the last remnants of rationale and lucidity she had was flooded out by the climax. Relishing in the pleasure, she immediately flashed forward towards her next target, her eyes filled with bloodlust and ecstasy. Damn where are they? I can't see anything ah. Within a blink of an eye, Rhea had appeared behind the soldier and severed his legs causing him to fall over. Despite the grievous wound the man still lived, however, he would have been better of dead. From the wound a purple flame rapidly spread throughout his entire body, causing the soldier to release a blood-curdling scream. The flames of Jaina were neither hot nor cold and did not damage the physical form. They are inextinguishable and will inflict the target with eternal pain till either till their minds break or someone puts them out of their misery. The cries of pain and despair sending an even greater wave of pleasure through Rhea, causing her to moan involuntarily. Shit, Alan, damn it. You monster. Getting off on this shit, the commander cried out, firing a hail of bullets towards Rhea. Without responding Rhea charged towards the commander laughing maniacally in her childish voice. Soon, the entire Dominion squad was eliminated. The lucky few now mere a messy collage of dismembered body parts and bodily fluids lining the floor and walls of the hallway, whilst those who weren't so lucky still breathed as they lay silent on the floor, enveloped by the flames of Jaina, their minds already broken. Rhea stood within the bloody carnage in front of the core room's containment door, her sanity no longer with her, she was operating purely on instinct like a ravenous beast. She no longer can clearly recall her reason for being here in the first place, now hunting for a next prey in order to experience the next wave of pleasure and ecstasy. From the information she gathered earlier, she knew there were more Dominion soldiers in the core room, more food to fuel her lustful bloodthirst. Without even attempting to have the door be opened, she approached the closed door, disappearing into a swarm of butterflies. Phasing through the containment door, she appeared on the opposite side in the core room. Within the core room was twenty-four Dominion soldiers, eighteen of them standing guard while the five remaining soldiers and their commander was huddled around the control console for the Penrose Corps, trying to figure out how they can operate the system. The Dominion soldiers had their lights on. However the light produced barely penetrated the looming darkness, the temperature of the frigid air so low that they had to switch to their self-contained breathing apparatus, SCPA, in order to breathe safely. What is that? The soldier closest to the door exclaims, seeing a faint purple light close to the door. Frederick, 
What light? I don't see anything. One of his comrades who was further back interjected. Samuel, you don't see that? There's a purple light there. I will go check it out. Wait, don't go alone. Before Samuel could catch up to Frederick, his light suddenly disappeared into the looming darkness. Upon seeing the light disappear, Samuel quickly ran forward in order to catch up to Frederick but he suddenly reached the containment door, with no Frederick in sight. Samuel not seeing Frederick anywhere started to panic, hastily pointing his light attached to his rifle everywhere around him, but he could not spot anything suspicious. His breathing rate rapidly increased, fogging up the visor on his SCBA, he frantically looked around him inching backwards until his back was against the containment door, when suddenly a loud thud sounded from beside him, he slowly turned his head towards the noise, shining his light upon it, it was the lifeless mangled corpse of Frederick, there was a gaping hole in his chest, his limbs bent into impossible angles and his face contorted into a look of abject horror, showing how terrified he was in his last moments, shit end before he could scream out, a shadowy figure darted out in front of him and he felt a sharp pain in his chest. Looking down, he saw a thin arm piercing through his chest, feeling the hand gripping something within, a powerful force pinning him against the door. As he looked up he saw a pale white face covered in blood staring straight at him. He tried to scream but the words got stuck in his mouth, too terrified to the point his brain stopped functioning. The figure then slowly removed the visor of his SCPA its hand slowly caressing his cheeks with its cold white fingers before it giggled in a childish voice, whispering. Thanks for the meal. A hauntingly beautiful and chilling voice entering his ears. The arm of the figure then quickly pulled out of his chest cavity, a still beating heart within its small hands. Before he could even process what he was seeing, the hand slowly gripped the heart with ever-increasing amounts of force, crushing it into a fleshy pulp spraying and squirting blood everywhere, his consciousness was then sent into an eternal slumber, never to awaken again. Hey, Frederick and Samuel why did you leave your post? Another soldier ran up towards the door, after not finding the two at their post, only to be see the horrific sight of Frederick's mangled body and the slumped over corpse of Samuel leaning against the door. Enemy contact, he yelled out alerting his comrades. In the corner of his eye he spotted faint purple light moving rapidly within the darkness. Reactively he aimed towards the light and squeezed the trigger down, releasing a stream of bullets towards the suspicious light. The muscle of his barrel flashed briefly, illuminating the area around him. He was horrified as he saw a blood-soaked young girl dashing towards him, her body low to the ground, before he could adjust his aim. There was a glint of a blade and his right arm was sent flying before the flames of Jehu ignited the stump and slowly spread through his entire body. Sounds of heavy footsteps could be heard running towards towards his location, their lights slowly growing brighter as they closed the distance. Making use of the darkness, Rhea dashed in and out of the Dominion's line of sight, ducking and weaving through their severely compromised sources of light, she killed and killed and killed. With each of slash of Jaina the number of light sources in the darkness dwindled, the soldiers were in complete disarray, they erratically pointed their rifle every which way trying to locate Rhea, their shaken minds jumping and reacting to every little noise and movement, no sooner did this happen is when confusion turned into full-blown chaos. Bang! A gunshot rang out in the darkness, a soldier, hearing the sound of movement beside him reactively fired his weapon. Gah! A cry rang out. Jackson, shit you hit Mark. The chaos ensues the soldiers getting picked off one by one, unable to locate their attacker. Every time they managed to catch a glimpse of Rhea she would simply meld back into the darkness, before reappearing near another soldier, her cold white hands dragging them into the abyss. Panicked soldiers fire their weapons in paranoia, reacting to every little sound or movement causing even more disruption within their ranks. The commander. The last remaining member of the Dominion squad squad slowly backed up, each step displacing the thick layer of mist creeping alongst the floor, his foot splashing against the pool of blood gathered beneath his feet, his weapons raised, trained against the looming darkness, the light being produced from his equipment was swallowed up into the abyss, his breathing was quick and shallow, 
he could feel his heart beating rapidly within his chest as if he was about to have a heart attack. With the adrenaline pumping through his system, his senses were heightened every little sound did not escape his notice. The faint sound of blood dripping onto the ground, the low groans and moans of soldiers who still yet breathed, and within all that he could hear the sound of splashing footsteps. Without hesitation, he fired a burst of rounds into where he heard the splashing footsteps. The bullets flew into the darkness, and nothing, not the sound of the bullets hitting metal or the sound of a body hitting the floor. Assuming that this initial burst was simply not enough to finish the job, he applied pressure on the trigger once again intending to finish the job when suddenly an injured figure walked out of the shadows. Claudia! The commander exclaimed, lowering his weapon and running up to the limping Claudia. Claudia's body was severely injured and her body swayed side to side, like a leaf in the wind. As the commander approached she collapsed forwards into his arms, coughing and hacking up a mouthful of blood. Shit! I didn't know it was you, I didn't accidentally hit you did I? The commander frantically exclaimed as he explored the bloody portions of her body, looking for a wound. Ha ha, luckily you were always a bad shot, you completely missed Alex. Claudia weakly replied, coughing up another mouthful of blood. SHH, don't speak, save your strength. We will get out of this mess all right. We will head back home safely okay, the two of us. Our children are waiting for us. So hang on a bit longer I will patch you up. Turning around the commander, Alex, reached towards the back of his belt to fish out his emergency medical kit. After groping around for a few seconds, he managed to retrieve the medical kit from the back of his belt. As he turned around he saw Claudia sitting up, her face inches from his own, her eyes staring directly into his own. His image was reflected within the dead glassy eyes of hers. Suddenly he felt a sharp pain in his chest. A growing heat slowly spreading throughout his body. Slowly looking down, he sees a knife piercing into his chest, blood beginning to stain his combat suit a bright red. Claudia's small hands were slowly plunging the knife further and further into his body, twisting the knife as she goes. Why? Reflexively Alex tries to push himself further away from Claudia. But she wrapped her left arm around his back, pulling him closer towards her as she continues twisting and digging the knife further into his chest. Alex struggled, attempting to break himself out of Claudia's hold but to no avail, her grip on him unnaturally strong. Claudia then leaned in close into Alex's ear and softly whispered into it. I hate you, I always have. I should have never married you. Wonder how I survived the attack. Well of course I struck an agreement with the enemy, after all I couldn't let anyone else kill you, so just die for me, you love me right so do grant me this wish of mine. Okay? Claudia leaned back out, giving Alex a wide grin. What, are you, saying, Alex stammered, despair written all over his face. Softly giggling, Claudia, pushed the knife all the way into his chest piercing his heart sending Alex into an eternal sleep. Are you done? Rhea's monotone voice echoed from the shadows. Well of course, but it was disappointing. My first play in years and I have to cut it short. What a heartless master you are. Claudia? Shrugged. Haphazardly tossing Alex's body to the side. There isn't any time for your cruel theatrics right now Jaina. Pot calling the kettle black I see. I am not the one leaving those poor souls alive back there as my flames slowly devour their souls and minds, whilst you get high of their pain and suffering. Unlike your barbarity, my methods are more graceful and elegant, their despair is everything they believed in crumbles into dust before their eyes, that taste is unmatched, each meal unique from one another. Ah, what a waste, that man was like a piece of undercooked meat. It could have been so much more. Jaina dramatically collapses onto the floor as she places the back of her hand against her forehead. I told you, I have no time for your theatrics right now. Help me get the core restarted, otherwise return to your astral form. He he. How cold of you. I wonder who made you that way. Briefly giving Jaina a side eye, Real ignored her remarks and walked towards the core's control panel. Yes, yes, I will help. You were so much cuter back then. Jaina stood up, her body igniting in an ethereal purple flame, the form of Claudia burning away revealing her true form beneath. Jaina had long flowing violet hair, 
shimmering golden pupils, standing at 185 centimeters tall and her right arm was just a bare skeleton with purple flames coating the bones. She wore a blackish purple dress with the hemline ending in her signature purple flames that danced along the ground. Butterfly-themed accessories and ornaments decorated her dress and long black opera gloves were worn on her right hand. 2. A0C6 Singularity Location, Bridge, Planetary Assault Carrier Avalon, Numa Star System Year, 1500 GSD 40 minutes after combat initiation, boom! An explosion ripped through the bridge scattering fragmentation throughout the area. Minimal damage was done to the bridge but Alyssa's body was sent flying backwards by the shockwave, colliding against a control terminal on the far side of the bridge. The explosion knocked the air out of her lungs. Her breathing was short and sharp as she gasped for air. With each breath came a splitting pain within her chest. The act of breathing was getting tougher by the second. Her ears were ringing as she placed her hands on her knees attempting to push herself up off the ground, however, her legs failed her as she immediately collapsed upon the ground. Turning her vision downwards, she could see that her legs were barely hanging on, the shrapnel having decimated the surrounding tissue down to the bone. Through her darkening and blurring vision, she could see that the Dominion soldiers were slowly but surely making progress towards her location. The quickly declining force of sentry guns no longer able to stall their advance adequately. She reached towards her thigh attempting to draw her side arm, but there was nothing there. She quickly scanned the area and spotted her weapons that were blown away during the explosion. Her rifle was a lost cause having launched too far from her position and was laying out in the open. Even with her lack of combat experience she knew that going for the rifle was tantamount to suicide. Her holster that contained her pistol was fortunately not far from her current position and the path towards it had adequate amounts of cover. With her legs no longer functional, she laid on her stomach and swiftly began crawling towards her pistol. With each movement her mind got hazier, evidently from the excessive blood loss, her tattered legs barely hanging on by a thread serving only to hamper her movements as they clumsily dragged alongst the floor. Even with the adrenaline coursing through her veins, each slight movement sent ripples of pain throughout her body, but she pressed onwards. Soon she managed to reach the location of her pistol, stretching her hands out as far as possible she grabbed the holster, her hands violently shaking as she struggled to remove the pistol from the holster, though her ears were still ringing from the explosion. Through the floor she could feel a vibration getting stronger as if someone was quickly approaching her. Just as she managed to remove the pistol from the holster, she could sense that someone was right beside her. Without thinking she flipped herself over and pulled the trigger on her pistol but there was a slight impact on her hand, knocking her aim of course, causing the bullet to harmlessly fly by her target. A quick kick soon followed, striking her on the stomach as she was sent rolling stopping as her back impacted the bridge's walls, she started hacking repeatedly from the kick as she pushed herself up into a sitting position her back supported by the wall behind her, she looked up and saw the Dominion soldiers surrounding her, their weapons drawn, her mind was slowly fading in and out of consciousness, her stamina all but drained, within her hands she could still feel the pistol but she no longer had the strength to lift it up and even if she could, she was certain that the soldiers would open fire as soon as she tried. Well if it isn't your highness, the princess of Ypres. Sorry for the discourtesy of meeting without an appointment but we are on a tight schedule you see. Normally, we would capture UHVT such as yourself, possibly negotiating your further out of the war in exchange for your return but alas, we have no such freedom to do so. We have orders not to leave anyone alive aboard this vessel and looking at your wounds it seems you are not long for this world without proper medical attention, something we haven't the ability to provide, the commander said as he looked over Alyssa's wounds. I caught Oof cough as she tried to respond, she coughed up a mouthful of blood, she tried to speak once again but with each attempt she coughed up even more blood. Due to the extreme blood loss her skin was deathly pale as the color was slowly fading from her eyes. Though this meeting was but short-lived we have to leave now. The commander bowed, gesturing towards the other soldiers using his head. Her vision was completely dark but she could guess what was going to happen momentarily. Her life flashed before her eyes as a single tear dripped down her bloody cheeks. 
as she lay there lifelessly awaiting her end. A single thought crossed her mind. Rear, I, bang. A gunshot echoed throughout the bridge. Yet Alyssa still breathed. She opened her weary eyes and saw the Dominion commander collapsed on the floor. Blood pooling out a gunshot wound to his head. Reinforcements had arrived. A follow-up of automatic fire then rained down on upon the Dominion soldiers, ambushed and caught out in the open by an unknown number of hostiles with minimal cover in sight. They were swiftly mowed down in the ensuing gunfire, with nary an ounce of opposition. Stragglers who escaped the initial onslaught and managed to seek cover were soon mopped up in short order. Out of the corner of her eye, Alyssa saw a blurry figure running towards her and soon she completely lost consciousness, her mind drifting off into darkness. Having heard news of the breach and the battle within the bridge, Rhea rushed back towards the bridge. As she was about to enter the bridge, the doors slid open and a squad of combat droids lead by a pink-haired girl rushed out of the bridge and passed he. In the center of the formation Rhea saw the critically injured Alyssa lying on a stretcher. Her leg's left leg was shredded and barely hanging on whilst her right leg was completely missing. Her arms was like Swiss cheese with bits and pieces of flesh hanging out and countless shrapnel embedded within. Her clothes were in pieces as she bled from countless wounds on her chest and abdomen. Eres, what happened? Sister Ria, Sister Alyssa is very badly injured. We are taking her to the medical ward right now. Sister Celine and Elisha are inside the bridge. You can ask them. We need to hurry. After a short exchange, Eres lead the combat droids past Trio and into the elevator behind her, where they will make their way to the medical ward afterwards. As Rhea entered the bridge, she saw combat droids carrying dead Dominion soldiers towards a corner of the bridge before tossing them into a pile. In the center where the main control console stood were two girls, one with light brown hair and glasses and the other with lilac hair in a light blue cat-eared hoodie. Celine, Elisha, what happened? Rhea questioned as she quickly approached the two. Rhea, a sizable Dominion squad breached the bridge from outside, similar to those throughout the rest of the ship. Within the ensuing firefight, Alyssa caught in the blast radius of a fragmentation grenade, thus leading to her injuries. We tried rushing here with our avatars and a contingent of combat droids but were delayed. When we got here she was already on the brink of death and after wiping out the remaining enemies on the bridge we sent here as with her to the medical ward. Celine reported, yeah, Inanna is already clearing a path from here to the medical ward together with Sebastian. After ensuring that Hires and Alyssa is safely inside the medical ward, she will lock down that sector to prevent further incursions and proceed to clear out the rest of the ship from hostiles. Well if anyone manages to break into the medical ward, Hires is the best among us in terms of defensive capabilities so they should be fine. Elisha languidly added on. What are we waiting for then? The stage is set. So why are we making our audience wait? An extra voice cut in from behind Rhea. Upon hearing that familiar voice, Celine and Elisha immediately materialized their weapons, striking at the shadowy figure behind Rhea. A pair of katanas from Celine bisected the shadowy figure into two before a hail of arrows fired by Elisha pierced the figure's head. The figure then collapsed into black pool before reforming itself. TCH. Celine clicked her tongue before sheathing her katanas. Such a cheat. Elisha complained, retuning her bow into her back. I'm saddened. Is that a way to greet a friend after so long? Taunted the figure. Silence. I don't ever recall us being friends. Celine replies as she adjusts her glasses. Interacting with you is exhausting. Elisha remarked. Stop provoking them Jaina rebuked Rhea. Fine. Fine if that is your wish dear master. If you would deny me the right to participate, I would sit here and spectate from the gallery. Jaina then proceeded to walk off to the side, materializing a chair from her shadow and sitting down on it, a wide grin on her face. Why did you bring her out again? After what she pulled the last time, Celine questions Rhea. Just ignore her. There are matters of greater import right now. Sigh. Understood. Elisha what the ship's status. After lazily tapping on the console for a bit, a holographic diagram of the ship appears. Light weapons at 95% efficiency and heavy weapons still at 100%. Shields are fully operational and all breaches have been temporarily sealed. I will just ignore the intruders as Inanna will handle them. As of now Avalon is fully combat ready. What's the plan? 
we are taking out the singularity core, the energy it is constantly emitting is preventing FTL travel out of the system and disabling the shields of the coalition fleet. It is imperative that it is destroyed if we have any hope of turning around this battle. Send a fleet-wide broadcast to retreat as soon as the Singularity Core is destroyed. Understood. Flight systems are all green, engines are online and full operational, warp drives ready. Eres has temporarily allowed me access to her authority partition. All deployed starfighters have been switched to autopilot with a preset targeting algorithm. Avalon. Tactical jump. A energy field begins to form at the front of the Avalon, sweeping through the entire ship, before the vessel disappears in the flash of light out of the coalition formation. Moments later, the Avalon reappears closer towards the Singularity Core. We have made it out of warp space. We have closed in on the target by roughly 60% of the original distance. Space ahead is too choppy no thanks to the Singularity Core. Too risky to proceed any further through warp space, Elisha reports. We are barely out of the effective range of our energy-based weapons. We have to close in more for them to deal any significant damage. Selene chimes in. Close the distance, flank speed. Begin firing the railguns at the target. The Avalon advanced along towards the layered singularity core, silvery light pouring out of the numerous engines at the rear as the engines operated at their maximum values. The weapons aboard the Avalon rotated facing front, the railguns immediately firing as soon as they received their firing solution from Selene. Streaks of light flew through the darkness of space as the shells made their way towards their target. Numerous weapons platforms surrounding the layered singularity core activated as soon as the shells entered their target acquisition range. Flak and point defense batteries open fired at the incoming shells attempting to intercept them before they struck their target. ETA to effective range 5 minutes, so far no signs of enemy interception. Enemy point defense fire is too heavy, only a minority of our attacks are making through the net. Switch the targets for the railguns to the enemy's weapons platform. Understood, changing target priorities. Scratch that, incoming warp signatures. A Dominion fleet is jumping in on an intercept course. Elisha interrupted, updating firing solution, timing our attacks to as soon as they exit warp space. The Avalon's weapons began firing towards empty space and as calculated by Selene, the Dominion ships exited warp space only to be immediately greeted with saturated attacks from the Avalon, destroying a large number of ships before they could even react. The majority of the Dominion ships that warped in were of the large variety, heavy cruisers, battleships, battle cruisers and carriers. Despite the unexpected preemptive strike by the Avalon, the Dominion forces quickly retaliated, firing all their weapons towards the Avalon. The carriers which warped in further back began launching swarms of starfighters out of their many hangars. Larger caliber kinetic rounds, pulses of bright white plasma and streaks of laser fire impacted the Avalon's shields causing ripples and sparks on impact. Ignoring the onslaught by the Dominion ships, the Avalon blitzed through their formation, ripping through the hulls and shields of the Dominion ships with ease. Each shot from the Avalon resulting in the catastrophic destruction of the Dominion vessels. Soon the swarms of Dominion starfighters intercepted the Avalon, swarming around the ship as they released their payloads of anti-ship torpedoes whilst dodging between the clouds of flak and targeted point defense fire. Once their payloads were depleted they swapped to their guns and fired upon the Avalon. Shields at 30% saturation, we have enough leeway remaining to complete our objectives before our shields drop. Elisha reported. ETA to effective weapons range one minute, Selene added on. Selene. We will use the main armament begin the firing process. Are you sure? The amount of energy used is enormous, if we use it. I know Selene however, we have nary the time to slowly chip away at the mega structure whilst under such a heavy assault. I understand the risks, so just do it. Very well, beginning firing sequence of anti-stellar object weapon. Wrong a miniad, the bow of the Avalon opened up. As the entire structure of the ship began to shift and transform, the internal layout of the vessel changed as a direct pathway to the, the Penrose core. The heart of the Avalon itself was revealed and exposed to the dark recess of space. The protective casing of the Penrose core split apart, 
revealing the massive artificial black hole housed within it. Vast amounts of stored and generated energy began flowing into an apparatus situated directly in front of the Penrose core, its purpose meant to focus and amplify the energy being gathered within the Penrose core. Energy levels reaching critical degeneracy, zero point energy field deployed and stable, shields adjusted and locked. Anti-stellar object weapon wrong a mini ad ready to fire at your command. Target, Dominion of Man Mega Structure. Layered Singularity Core. Wrong a mini ad fire. Upon Rear's command, the built up energy was released all at once in a single beam of blinding white energy. The beam tore through the darkness of space disintegrating everything caught in its wake. Even entities not within the immediate path of the attack had their hulls melted due to the extreme heat produced. As the bream approached its target, multiple layers of interlacing shields were deployed around the Singularity Core in order to defend against the attack. However, the sheer destructive power of Rong Aminiad rendered such a defense futile as the beam merciless penetrated the shield as it were mere sheets of paper. With the last of its defenses destroyed, Wrong Aminiad's attack flew right into the heart of the Singularity Core, where a mesmerizing yet chaotic swirl of black and white energies mixed. As the attack collided with the energies within the Singularity Core a brief moment of silence ensued, with nothing no definitive changes happening. Suddenly, all hell broke loose as the energy within the center of the Singularity Core grew unstable its massive size quickly condensing towards a single point. The surrounding space became increasingly fragile as visible fractures can be seen within the fabric of space and time, creating a massive rift of broken space. An enormous wave of energy burst forth from the point of collapse, sweeping across the battlefield, the Dominion ships which were closer to the Singularity Core as it collapsed took the full brunt of the energy nova. As soon as the energy nova made contact with their shields it immediately shattered. The forces holding the molecular bonds of the materials that comprises the hull were destroyed, ripping the ships apart into their base elements. Brace for impact. Rear alerted, through the ship-wide announcement system, the energy nova soon made contact with the Avalon sending shock waves throughout the entire ship. Shields are down. Hull breaches across deck 35, fires have broken out in throughout numerous areas on the ship, activating damage control. Temporary repairs from the earlier boarding action have come undone. Suddenly, there was a sharp tug felt throughout the ship, nearly knocking everyone off balance. The fractured drift in space generated a huge gravity well causing everything left intact nearby to be pulled into it. The Avalon while faring much better than the Dominion ships had lost their engines owing to the Energy Nova, now immobilized, the Avalon was unable to resist the effects of the gravity well. So, it has finally begun. Jaina solemnly spoke, unlike her usual self. The other three on the bridge, turned to look at her questioningly. What has begun? Rhea questions, flashing back to the mysterious figure she met in her dreams earlier. Safer to not know at this moment. Master I will be heading back first it's a bit dangerous for me to be out here right now, Jaina says in melancholy, her figure disappearing within a swarm of butterflies. With the disappearance of Jaina, the Avalon helplessly falls into the fracture drift. End of Act Zero, thrice fold beginning. 2. A 1c1 final bastion Thule, two figures clad in tattered cloaks could be spotted running through the shadows of dilapidated buildings. The taller figure held the hand of the shorter one while they ran down the street, as they ran their feet splashed against a red fleshy substance that coated the every inch of the ground below them, its corrupting touch partially creeping up the abandoned buildings, the substance pulsed and wiggled as if alive, its smell putrid like a corpse that have been left out in the scorching sun. Come on Adrian, we have almost reached the next haven, it's just around the corner. The taller figure said to the shorter one, I can't anymore, Lucas, I, Adrian replied, completely out of breath, his knees giving up as he collapsed onto the ground, upon seeing the young boy Adrian collapsed, Lucas turned around crouched beside him, his arms cupped behind his back, signaling for Adrian to get on his back, quick get on, I will carry you, before they catch up, thanks, 
sorry for being a burden. Adrian apologized as he climbed onto the back of Lucas. Lucas slowly adjusted his posture for balance whilst also ensuring the Adrian was properly secured and had a good grip on his back. He stood up and sprinted down the street once again. The hope that safety was near and the determination to protect his brother spurring him onwards. No sooner did he start his sprint, a growl nearby entered his ears. Instinctively, he dived towards the ground, a gust of wind blowing right beside his head. Due to him carrying his brother Adrian on his back, the emergency dive sent both of their bodies rolling along the fleshy ground. Using the momentum from his roll, Adrian launched himself upwards landing softly on his feet and immediately scanned his surroundings. Five humanoid-shaped figures surrounded the two brothers, though their profile could be said to be vaguely humanoid in shape, everything else was completely alien, their bodies were covered in the same red fleshy substance that coated the ground and buildings. Their limbs were contorted in impossible directions as the red substance formed into sets of extra appendages, red tentacles breached through what remained of the victim's skin flaying around haphazardly. Gurgling and moaning noises could be heard emanating from the creature's throat, their hosts still well alive and conscious yet unable to control their own bodies, merely a spectator trapped in everlasting anguish. Damn, the lesser remnants have caught up already, more are definitely on their way. I have to clear this group out and quickly escape to the haven with Adrian immediately. Lucas lowered his posture getting into a combat stance his hands outstretched to his sides, as if he was a beast ready to pounce on his prey, his eyes flashed a deep violet as he charged towards the group of lesser remnants, his right arm transforming into a grotesque beastly claw of purple and black, thrice the size of his regular arm. The tentacles and extra appendages of the lesser revenant swiped towards as it lunged towards Lucas, its arms raised poised to attack. As soon as Lucas entered striking range, he swiped at the extra appendages and tentacles, dismembering them into tiny pieces. He then propelled himself further forward, right next to the lesser revenant before swiping upwards with his claws, splitting the lesser revenant vertically into three parts. After finishing off the first lesser revenant, he darted to the right where the next two lesser revenants are. Approaching the closer one he slammed his claws down upon his head, crushing its body into bloody pancake on the ground. The next lesser revenant lunged towards Lucas but was forcefully swatted aside, its body smashing into the nearby building. The outer wall of the abandoned building collapsed upon impact, falling atop the body of the lesser revenant. After dispatching the two lesser revenants, Lucas made way to the remaining two and quickly eliminated them, determining that combat was over. His eyes returned to its regular brown color and his arm returned back into its human form. Lucas then collapsed onto his knees his stamina completely spent, his breathing quick and heavy. I did it. My first actual solo combat. No time to find Adrian and head to the haven. Adrian ran out from the shadows of abandoned vehicles, a look relief plastered on his face. When suddenly, his expression turned grave, a panicked expression quickly taking form upon his face. Lucas, watch out, behind you. Adrian yelled as he ran towards his brother. Hearing Adrian's warning, Lucas spun around and his right arm started to transform again. With his back still facing the lesser revenant, he could see the revenant's arm barring down towards him. Not good, I won't make it. Bang! The sound of a gunshot echoed throughout the empty street. A large fist-sized hole opened up in the lesser revenant's chest. Bang, bang. Two more successive gunshots rang out, causing another two holes to appear in the lesser revenant's abdomen and head. Having suffered lethal damage, the lesser revenant collapsed onto the street, its lifeless corpse slowly turning into dust and scattering into the wind. This should do as a lesson as to not simply just knock you enemies around. A feminine voice came from up high. Lucas and Adrian both looked upwards to where the voice came from, spotting a figure standing atop one of the abandoned buildings. The figure then jumped off the building, doing a mid-air somersault, the sun shining bright behind them, before landing softly on their feet. The figure removed their hood and pulled down their mask, revealing a young woman with bright crimson hair and eyes. She stood at around 185 centimeters tall, her cloak obscuring her actual clothes and figure. Not bad for an amateur, 
but in the future refrain from knocking your enemies around without confirming the kill, look over there, the woman said in a bright and energetic voice, her right arm wrapped around Lucas's shoulders while she pointed at the partially destroyed building wall. The one that ambushed you came from there, it was third one that you knocked away, it was your mistake assuming the debris simply falling onto a revenant would be enough to kill it, the woman pointed out, releasing her hold on Lucas. Um, thank you for saving me, Miss Lucas bowed. Irene, Irene Lyardmler, you can call me whatever you wish, Lucas and Adrian I suppose? Yes, then Miss Lyardmler, once again thank you for saving us, but how long were you following us? Hey, so you are one of those types. Lucas, are you alright? You are not hurt are you? Adrian worriedly asks, his roaming around Lucas's body to check for injuries. I am fine, thanks to Miss Lyudmila here. Lucas gestured to Lyudmila with his palm. Ah. Thank you for saving us, Miss Lyudmila. Adrian too bowed. Oh, no worries. Furthermore, to answer your previous question, I have been following you for the past 30 minutes, I spotted you guys a ways out during one of my regular patrols. It wasn't that hard to see you, with you guys running down the street and all. Quite a big horde you guys drug up to from your home of Seventh Haven. Lyudmila smirked. That's right there was a massive horde chasing us, we need to leave quickly. Adrian panically said. Ah that horde, let's just say it won't be a problem anymore. Lyudmila Riley smiled, her finger scratching her cheek. But the commotion here would have certainly drawn undue attention and I am not really confident in protecting two exhausted people against any decently sized horde, not really up my alley. So let's go. The haven is just around the corner. I will protect you guys up till then. Lyudmla said, snapping her fingers. Got it. With her command the three of them quickly made their way down the remainder of the street towards the haven. As the, the trio rounded the corner. The walls of the haven came into view. The haven was a large compound surrounded by large glimmering black walls with sentries and watch towers stationed at regular intervals throughout the walls. Before the walls laid a repulsion field barrier, purposed built to prevent revenants up to a certain class from passing through. After a bit of running Vatria managed to make it to the front gate where a contingent of guards were guarding the entrance to the haven. As they approached the gate, the guards spotted them and waved recognizing one of their own amongst their midst. Sister Irene, I don't believe it's time for your patrol to end yet, but I believe it has to do with the two beside you. Yeah, I spotted them running over here earlier. They got caught by a small group of lesser revenants so I helped them a little before escorting them here. I need to head back out, make sure nothing unsavory followed us back. I don't know their situation so why don't you guys get acquainted first. See you guys later. After reporting in, Lyudmila turned on her heels and jumped to an adjacent building, making her way back the way they came. So you heard the lady. I'm Lucas Olia and this. Adrian Olia, both brothers reaching for our for handshake. Nice to meet you, Lucas, Adrian the guard responding to their respective handshakes. Gregson Mathis, you can just call me Gregson, as you can see I am a gate guard in the Sixth Haven, nice to meet you Gregson, I noticed you called Miss Lyudmla sister earlier, are you guys related by any chance? No, it's just what we at the guards call her, she is like everyone's elder sister after all, the commander, commander, ah, she didn't mention it I guess, that's so like her, she is the commander of the guards charged with the external defense of the Sixth Haven. I see, I didn't know she was such an important person, Adrian replied. Well from how she acts you won't really know unless otherwise told. Oh that reminds me, what are you two doing here? From the direction you two came from it could only be the Seventh Haven, but that is quite far ain't it? Gregson shrugged. Dot the Seventh Haven, is no more. Lucas somberly replied. Internal or external? Internal. I was there at the site of the breach, Adrian replied. I see, we didn't receive any word from the Seventh Haven before the fall, it was fast and brutal, we barely had time to even escape. Adrian added on, his gaze lowered to the ground, but I wonder what is happening though, within a year the Tenth to Seventh Haven has fallen. Lucas mumbles under his breath, it is certainly concerning, but let's forget about that now. You two must be exhausted. Let's head in and we can settle you guys in. Welcome to the Sixth Haven.
I expected the scuffle earlier to draw in some revenants, but this is a tad much no? Where did they even come from I am pretty sure I checked this area a short while ago. Irene Lyadmla stood atop the ruins of an abandoned building where the corrupting influence of the red fleshy substance known as creep have yet to invade. She looked down at the street below, a flood of revenant already shambling down below slowly making their way towards the sixth haven. Lesser classes, greater classes, baron classes, viscount classes, and I even spy a couple of earls here. What is going on here? For so many revenants to be what appears to be working together is unprecedented, especially those titled revenants. The outer repulsion field barriers can barely withstand the attacks from a baron class but now we got viscounts and earls in the midst. The repulsion field barriers were meant to keep out lesser and greater revenants only and while they could withstand baron class revenants attacks, they were not made with that purpose in mind and the barrier would quickly fail before long. What to do? I could probably handle an earl class or two but with all these other revenants in the way. Even that will be too much for me. But, the amount of revenants gathering together in this fashion was simply unheard of, while the walls of each haven was made of special materials that could withstand attacks from earl classes, it wouldn't last longer against such a heavy onslaught by so many revenants. With the revenants all clogging up the street, it kind of looks like a traffic jam. It should take a while for them to actually reach the haven. I need to investigate where they are coming from. But first, Irene reached towards her thighs, and grabbed the holstered flare gun. She then loaded a red flare and launched it into the air, which was then followed up by a dark indigo flare. The first flare was to signify the presence of a horde and their size, blue referring to a moderate-sized horde, yellow for a large horde and red for a massive horde. The second flare signifies the highest ranked revenant within the horde, green for baron brown for viscount, purple for earl, orange for marquis and grey for duke and above. The shade of the colour will notate the amount of the highest ranked class present in the horde. The darker the colour the more revenants of the class there are, for hordes only consisting of lesser and greater revenants. No secondary flare is required. Now that I have warned the haven, I think I will go check out the seventh haven. Those two came from there and they clearly only came here for refugee. Thus it can only mean Seventh Haven has fallen. After reconfirming the details of the horde matched her flares, Irene travelled through the rooftops making her way towards the Seventh Haven. As she made her way through the rooftops, she surveyed the area as she went, noticing that the streets were also packed full of revenants of the greater variety, with the occasional lower titled revenants being spotted. What the hell is happening here? The amount of titled classes I have seen today feels like way more than was ever spotted within the walls of Thule before and more importantly what are those doing here? In the distance where the seventh haven was she could see the silhouette of masses of creep that formed into what seem like purpose-built structures, as if the revenants were building out certain structures. Revenants could be seen flooding out of them likely a production building of some kind. To think that the inside of Thule has reached this stage of the corruption, spawning pits, evolution courts and even biochurrits, the outside corruption has made it inside. I should head back, any further and those turrets will spot me, and having the entire Revenant army on my tail doesn't sound like a fun time. If Seventh Haven is in this state, I can assume that 8th to 10th Haven is in an even worse state of corruption with more advanced structures present. As she turned round to leave, she detected a killing intent being directed towards her and the sound of something cutting through wind. She immediately raised her gun in front of her and just in time too, her gun exploded into pieces as hardened shards of creep stuck onto what remains of the weapon dissolving the gun into a blackened liquid. Iron backstepped multiple times, with each step more shards of creep pierced the ground at her previous location, liquefying the ground in contact with it. Warning shot say, it seems that whatever is in there doesn't like me snooping around. I think I will accept this boon and leave while I still can. Irene then quickly left the surrounding of the 7th Haven, retreating back to her home base of the 6HT Haven. In the distance a pair of deep crimson eyes staring at her fleeing back. Arc 1, the corrupted bastion, terror. 2, a 1c2 plant fall. Rhea, reawake. Rhea wake up, as Rhea slowly regained consciousness. 
she felt herself laying stop the cold hard metal floor as the Avalon, the two AIs in their avatars were crouched beside her as they assessed her physical status. Seeing that Rhea had regained consciousness, Celine grabbed her arms and helped her up on her feet. Elisha, can you please help instead of lazing around? I am tired, I want to sleep. Did so much work, don't disturb me. Elisha sleepily replied as she was slumped over the center console. In response Celine shook her head in disapproval. Celine what happened? Rhea questions, clutching her head in pain as she suffers from a massive headache. I can't really say, while our internal clock says that it has only been an instant since we were dragged into the fracture in space. But according to system time, around 600 years has passed since then. 600 years, correct. However the fact that to put it lightly you are still alive, it would seem that we were in some sort of stasis until recently or at least until we return to normal space. We have no idea where we have been spat back at it so I have taken the liberty of begin a redshift projection to determine our coordinates. It shouldn't take long to receive accurate results. What's the ship status? The Penrose core is still up and operational and thanks to the apparent 600 years time gap. Our energy reserves are completely full. Our engines are down and require extensive maintenance due to it not being operated for such a large stretch of time. We are not going anywhere for now. Elisha answered, her head buried within the soft comfort of a pillow. How is Alyssa? She was placed into the recovery pod to stabilize her before we entered stasis. Now that we are out of combat, she will be sent to undergo surgery to remove the shrapnel in her body. Afterwards it will be back to the recovery pod to heal any remaining damages. Unknown time to complete recovery. Celine replied. Do you wish to see her? Elisha chimed in. No. There is nothing I can do by heading over to the medical ward. I will just be in the way. Erez can handle matters down there. There is under things I must take care of first. A communication request from Inanna was then received by the central console. Rhea interacted with the console and accepted the communications request, a hologram of Inanna then appearing from the console. Hey, what is going on? I was in the middle of combat and suddenly I found myself passed out on the floor. When I stood back up, all the remaining Dominion soldiers were unconscious. It made easy work with the dispatch of the remaining intruders though. At Inanna's request, Celine quickly communicated with her on the current situation through the AI's internal network which allows quick and massive transfers of information almost instantly. I sent all the relevant data to you, and while I was at it I briefed Heres of the situation too, so that we are all up to speed. So what is the plan Rhea? Bring up the map of the current star system. A holographic map of the current star system then appeared atop the central console. The system consisted of a class G3V star along with seven exoplanets. One planet which is too near to the sun to support life, one within the Goldilocks zone and the rest being various sizes of gas giants. After comparing the current star system to various star charts in Avalon's database and applying a 600 years time skip simulation, there is only one match. The Lucian star system. Home system of the United Terran systems. However, it's odd. Agreed. We suddenly appeared within their home system without warning and yet there have not been any contact from UTS forces, also while not exactly the central trade hub of the galactic market. There are normally regular traffic from merchants and travelers, but now it is completely empty. Elisha added on, head still buried within pillows, we are currently right above their capital world of terror. What is the situation down there? Rhea asks. This is, something is clearly afoot. There is thick clouds of unknown particulates within the atmosphere. Precision scans cannot penetrate it but generalized scans reveal a large amount of biological activity down there. It is as if the planet is alive. That's how much biological signature the planet is currently giving out. There isn't much we can accomplish while sitting down here. Let's head on down to investigate what is going on. Maybe we can find some information about what has happened in the past 600 years down there. We have a battleship in the hangar currently undergoing maintenance correct? Affirmative. It was under maintenance due to damage to its warp drives. If we don't require it to perform any warp jumps, it is a perfectly serviceable vessel. Very well, I will take Inanna and Selene with me as we head planet side, 
Elisha you rest up here on the bridge and coordinate the repairs of the Avalon and handle communications with the ground team once we get a foothold down there. Without replying, Elisha gave a thumbs up towards Rhea, acknowledging her orders. After apprising Anana of the plan, Rhea and Selene went towards the capital ship hangars where the battleship was currently going through maintenance. When the pair arrived at the hangar, Anana could be seen waiting for them. She stood there leaning against a pillar with her eyes closed. As the two approached, she opened her eyes and looked towards them. Slow. I took the liberty of arming and supplying the Failnord class battleship for planet side operations, within the time you took for you to arrive. Inanna exclaimed her arms on her hips. It cannot be helped. We had to take so many detours due to the extensive damages through the ship. Selene sighed, her hands pinching the bridge of her nose. Come on let's head on board, the deployment procedures have been done already, we should head down and collect some information on the time we find ourselves in. Failnord class battleship. A highly modular battleship able to be quickly customized to suit the situation. Its was currently configured for planet side operations. It was equipped with base building modules, which allowed for prolonged operations on a hostile environment. It was also fitted with production facilities for equipment water and food in the event that such resources were not readily available. A small hangar bay was also attached, which allows the storage and deployment of dropships and land vehicles. The ship's weaponry with was adjusted to focus on kinetic weaponry which destructive potential was unmatched while the projectile flight time being a non-factor due to such close ranges. When Rhea, Inanna and Selene boarded the vessel, they did a once over on the ship's equipment and facilities while reconfirming their objectives. Soon, the checks were completed and all parties were satisfied in commencing the operation. Elisha, we are ready down here. Failnord class battleship will be designated Failnord. Got it. Beginning launch procedures for Failnord. At the right side of the Avalon, the downwards facing hangar doors opened up. The only thing separating the inside of the Avalon from the clawed reaches of space was the atmospheric stabilizer field, a blue energy field that prevented the atmosphere from escaping the ship. The gravity catapults then spooled up before launching the battleship along its hypothetical rails into space. As the Failnord class battleship left the confines of the Avalon, it immediately descended and made weight towards Planet of Terror. Before long, the battleship was about to enter the planet's exosphere. This is a reminder that once you enter the mesosphere where the unknown particulates are blanketing the entire planet, you lose all contact with the Avalon. Once you make plant fall, if possible construct a comms beacon it will at least allow rudimentary communication, where you can call in fire support or reinforcements if need be. If there is nothing else, good luck. Elisha out. Elisha's communication was disconnected from her end but a planet with unknown situation, going down to investigate and discover the various happenings. Feels like old times, Inanna excitedly said. Indeed, in which case, whatever happened to that pest? Selene queries. Jaina? No clue. She isn't responding even when I call her, but it won't pose an issue regarding my combat capabilities. Rhea responds. Jaina hey, if only back then you didn't. Don't go there Inanna. I don't regret my decisions back then, I was just saying, a awkward silence permeated the cockpit but was soon relieved when the battleship entered the planet's mesosphere, the battleship rumbled as the winds with the cloud formation rocked the entire ship, thunder echoed around the battleship as, lightning struck the ship's shields, the rumbling continued until it suddenly stopped, the ship having broke past the mesosphere and entered the planet's stratosphere, what the hell is this? Inanna exclaimed. As they entered the stratosphere what greeted them down below was a world of literal red, the light of the star barely illuminating the world below. Red fleshy substances covered every inch of the surface, even managing to form what seemed like structures. Towering monstrosities of red flesh roamed the lands, alongside creatures of smaller stature. That red substance is giving off biological readings, it seems this substance has infested the entire surface of the planet. The substance seems to also be able to take various forms that mimic life. Such a creature has never been documented, Selene excitedly states. Selene though under normal circumstances had an uptight and serious personality, 
but when discovering new and interesting things she will get very heated. You know, not to burst your bubble on anything Celine, but that weird mound of flesh is looking at us funny in an unonchalantly states. The weird flesh mound that in an appointed out suddenly fired a massive blob of red substance at the battleship. Celine quickly took control of the battleship and deftly dodged the projectile. However, more flesh mounds of similar nature soon took notice of their ship as well and started firing upon it, unable to avoid the amount of projectiles being lobbed their way with the agility of the battleship. Some of the globules managed to hit the battleship, impacting against the shields. Inanna, did you find any safe areas where we can land or is this entire planet just a giant hostile life form? There seems to be an area where there is minimal biological activity relatively speaking. It should be safe to head over there. All right quickly take us there. If the shields drop from receiving too many hits, it might cause an infestation on board. As the battleship approached the designated area a massive blue energy field could be spotted stretching up into the sky. Behind the barrier were towering black walls that were half the height of the barrier. Behind the walls was a sprawling city, relatively untouched by the red substance. Rhea, it seems that there are signs of human life within the walls, albeit minimal. Though it seems the red substance has managed to breach the protected zone, it has only contaminated about 40% of the city's area. There should still be survivors within the uncontaminated areas. Yeah we should. Boom. A gigantic mushroom cloud extended into the sky from a location near the boundaries separating the contaminated zone and the uncontaminated zones within the city. There are still sign of combat around the explosion, are we gonna assist? Inanna asks, Rhea let's assist them, it's a good chance to gather information and by helping them we can establish good rapport with them from the outset. If we were to appear to them normally it might garner much suspicions from them. Celine inputs her opinion. Very well, we will enter combat and assist them. Deploy the combat droids and equip with them with thermal weaponry. Ballistics would likely be ineffective. Inanna and I will head down also. Celine coordinate the battle for above. Inform us if the situation changes. With their roles assigned, Ryu and Inanna went towards the drop pod hangars whilst Celine stayed behind on the bridge. Inanna, when we are on the ground, take control of the droids and control the situation. I will act accordingly. Got that. It's my specialty after all. The two quickly made their way to the hangars where the drop pods were located. We will be splitting up here. I will be using the less conventional method. Take care. Inanna acknowledge before entering a drop pod. Rhea left the drop pod chambers and entered and located towards the side of the room which lead directly outside the ship. Her usual uniform once again disintegrated into flames and butterflies, replaced by with her combat dress. Her scythe already in hand. Hopefully these creatures will be sufficient. A slight smile of anticipation gracing her lips. Ryu approached the airlock doors and pushed a button, opening doors leading out of the ship. She approached and stepped on the edge of the airlock, her hair and dress wildly fluttering in the wind rushing into the airlock. Ryu spun on her heels before shifting her weight backwards, causing her to fall back first out of the airlock. A trail of enchanting purple flames and butterflies trailing behind her as she descends. Rapidly approaching the ground, she corrected her posture and faced towards the surface, the scene of carnage unfolding in her eyes. A line of humans were desperately fighting against a flood of what appeared to be humans infected by the red substance and creatures that seemed to be purely made out of the red substance. A large creature significantly larger than the others on the front lines entered Rhea's eyes. With her target set, she readies her scythe, the purple flames already dancing along its edge. 1. A 1 C 3 Siege of Sixth Haven Irene hastily made her way back to the haven, jumping across rooftop to rooftop. The swarms of revenants still gathered on the streets below. As she got closer and closer to the haven, the distinct sounds of battle was growing increasingly louder. Damn it. I shouldn't have left to investigate the source of the revenants. Sixth Haven does not have many awakened and even those awakened are not especially well versed in combat. If the revenants make it through the black walls it will be an absolute massacre. Irene picked up her pace, in her hands she manifested a long thin white spear with gold accents. It's been a while since I used this, as she got closer. 
she could pick up the sounds of continuous gunfire which was briefly interrupted by explosions. Awakened were absurdly rare. Thus to supplement the defense force the utilization of standard weapons was still required. Awakened within Thule was deployed from the first haven or the capital as it was referred to more often. Havens were usually classified into three categories, capital with only the first haven belonging in this category, sanctuaries which the second to fifth haven belongs to, and outposts which the sixth to tenth haven belong to. Generally speaking the lower the number designated on the haven the better the security and living conditions were. While the difference isn't very noticeable among the sanctuaries, it was very apparent in the capital and within the outposts. The Sixth Haven was technically a pseudo-sanctuary and thus while not in any significant number or quality, it still had the luxury of having awakened stationed there. Standing on the roof next to Combat Zone, she saw multiple rows of guardsmen stationed on various points on the bridge firing upon the never-ending flood of revenants. The damage they were dealing was almost negligible. It was like using a spoon to drain the ocean. The only thing working in favor at the guards was that they were defending a bridge. The tight choke point made it difficult for the revenants to take advantage of their numbers. From the Black Hall's ramparts, supportive fire from artillery pieces and heavy turrets decimated the approaching revenants. However those were only the lesser revenants. Once the great revenants entered the front lines it was likely that the revenants swarm will slowly be able to make progress due to their greater speed and endurance. Should a titled class revenant join the fray the front line will immediately collapse as the only way to defeat a titled class revenant was by an awakened. The irony was that while the revenant's corpses disappearing after death was convenient in many ways under normal circumstances, had the bodies remained after being killed, the guardsmen would have likely be able to hold off the onslaught, the mountains of corpses helping to stem the tide. If only we could destroy the bridge, the mistakes of the past rearing its ugly head once again. Irene muttered under her breath, the tide of revenants have now slowly began progressing through the bridge, the great revenants having taken to the front, the first battle line already being overrun. The guards stationed there attempted to run while the checkpoint further back covered their retreat but to no avail. As soon as they turned their backs, the firepower being outputted quickly decreased, the revenants quickly massacring the retreating guards. Iron leapt into the air off the roof of the building she stood upon. Her spear pointed towards the horde of revenants. A brilliant azurora encased her spear as she dived deep into the midst of the revenant horde. She impacted the ground with tremendous force, knocking back the surrounding revenants, causing some to fall of the bridge to their deaths. Revenants near the epicenter of her landing point had their bodies mutilated from the shockwave alone. Commander, the remaining retreating guards shouted, recognizing the appearance of Irene. Quickly get to the next checkpoint. I will hold them off. Thank you. Irene danced on the battlefield her spear slicing and piercing the approaching revenants. With her strength alone she managed to halt the revenants advance to a standstill. With the support of the guardsmen at checkpoints behind her, she was slowly driving back the tide, but only temporarily. With each kill Irene's spear slowly loses its pure white luster. Its color slowly dyed an ominous red. Heavy footsteps shook the ground as three large dog-like creatures of reddish-black coloration trampled over the great revenants as they approached the front lines. Bullets and explosions constantly impacted their fleshy bodies yet after the smoke cleared, they had suffered nary a scratch upon themselves. Baron class revenant, black dog. In a pack they can be comparable to a Viscount class revenant. Luckily this tight space prevents them from using their mobility. Without much warning, the black dogs made a mad dash towards her. She took her spear and threw it like a javelin towards the black dog in the center of the charge. Normally, the black dogs would easily dodge such a throw but due to their restricted mobility from the terrain, the spear landed true. The spear pierced the black dog up till halfway up its shaft, a non-lethal injury. The black dog yelped in pain as it staggered, halting its advance. Just as the black dog shook off the attack, thirty blood-red barbs exploded from within the black dog's body, ripping it into shreds, killing it instantly. Iron dashed towards the dead black dog, ripping out her spear from its dead body. She immediately swung her spear to the right knocking back an approaching black dog. She then lunged towards the black dog, 
as she entered striking range, she delivered a flurry of multiple quick thrusts with her spear. Her attack inflicted many minor penetrative wounds onto the black dog. She then leapt into the air, high above the black dog. Kicking the air she dived towards the black dog, skewering and killing it. By the time she killed the second black dog, the final black dog was right next to her, its jaws fully opened ready to bite down on her. Irene pulled out the spear lodged into the second black dog and thrusted it right into the open jaws of the final black dog killing it. Three black dogs down, but the battle is far from over. While Irene was fighting the black dogs, the guardsmen behind supported her, targeting the approaching lesser and greater revenants, preventing them from interfering with Irene's battle. After the killing of the first three black dogs, the battle dragged on for hours. The guardsmen fought valiantly as they stood their ground against the onslaught of Revenant. Checkpoint after checkpoint was overrun and the guardsmen were pushed back to their final two checkpoints before the gates of the Sixth Haven. In order to conserve her stamina Irene, only fought when a titled class Revenant appeared at the front. She wanted to continue fighting the lesser and greater Revenants too. However she knew that doing so will waste her valuable stamina. Should she become exhausted and fall, the battle will be lost as there was no one capable enough to deal with the titled revenants. Where the hell are those useless fools? Irene shouted as she rested at the final checkpoint, no titled classes having been spotted yet. They said that they had to guard the spillway, Gregson replied as he scratched his head. Nonsense. If the gates fall there will be nothing left to guard. There is no signs of an internal outbreak. What's the point of standing around there twiddling their thumbs? Those cowards. I understand our new arrivals from earlier not helping as that boy was clearly newly awakened and untrained. But those cowards hiding at the back have no excuse. Gregson go there and drag their asses out. Don't ask for the impossible commander. I already tried many times earlier but those inner lackeys are denying all access to them right now. Those meddling. Commander, report. Marquis class revenant cited, it's a crusade of all things, Gregson get those damn awake and out of the inner sanctum and over here. I don't think I can handle a crusade alone, a woo -oo -oo. A terrifying howl resounded across the land, its howl could be heard throughout the entirety of Sixth Haven. I have to go that is the first already. Irene immediately leapt to front line. Irene took the initiative and resorted to using her strongest attack immediately. Her once pure white spear now fully dyed a crimson red was ready. In the skies above the Crusade, Irene made her move. Her beloved spear glowed with a brilliant red aura, six additional spears mirroring the appearance of the original manifested around her. Spear of Dunscathe, a stream of blood born in your arrival, rend my foes asunder. The six spears floating around Irene was launched towards the Crusade each spear pinning the massive hand with a shaggy green coat to the bridge. The Crusade struggles against this surprise attack, trying to break free of the spears. However the spears did not budge, rooted firmly into the ground. Within its struggle, it released a second howl that reverberated throughout the sixth haven. That the second. Only one more remains. Now perish. Gae Bulg Spear of Mortal Death. Using her feet. Irene kicked the gay bulk towards the Crusade. A the blood red spear streaked through the air like a meteor, piercing the Crusade. A large explosion occurred, releasing a towering mushroom cloud into the air, the force of the explosion leaving a massive crater in the bridge. A thick cloud of dust and smoke lingered in the area, reducing visibility. Irene landed on the edge of the crater as she collapsed onto her knees, her strength almost exhausted from unleashing the attack. Should she need to fight she would be able to but she would be less effective. Hopefully that killed it. I don't think I can finish it off before the final howl, if it is still alive. As Irene knelt there recovering, the sound of soft footsteps entered her ears. Damn, so it lives. The Crusade slowly limped out of the crater, its body heavily injured but still alive, hemorrhaging massive amounts of purple blood. Though on the verge of death, it lifted up its head prepared to release the final howl before its demise. Ah, so it's the end. Irene closed her eyes ready to embrace the end. She tried her best, did what she could, and yet it wasn't enough in the end. Yet the end never came. Irene opened des the hem of a dress, coated in purple flames. Butterflies danced in the air, 
long platinum silver hair fluttering in the wind. An ornate scythe resting on the tiny back of the young girl, a lantern attached on the scythe releasing a mesmerizing purple glow. Who are you? Wait what about the Kusaith? Rhea. Kusaith? You meant that? Rhea adjusted her position to the side, revealing the Kusaith cleanly bisected into half, the corpse already starting to fade. Rhea stared at the rapidly fading corpse, her eyes furrowed in deep contemplation. That energy, after being exposed to it for so long there is no way I can mistake it. But what is it doing here? My name is Irene Lyadmler, I am the commander of the guards of Sixth Haven, thank you for your assistance. Had the Kusaith's final howl went off it would have been devastating. You seem to be a pretty strong awakened. The battle is hardly over. It would be great if you can help out. That massive explosion earlier, was it caused by you? <laughs> ah yes, that was the ability of my weapon Gae Bulb that I manifested upon my awakening. Irene replied, a hint of suspicion in her voice. Those kinds of abilities shouldn't have existed back then. This awakening must be related to that place in some way. Wait, enough about us. The battle is still ongoing we have to push back the horde. Don't worry, my comrades will handle it. Rhea assures, as she helped Iron to her feet. Comrades, as if on cue, multiple explosions occurred within the midst of Revenant Horde, decimating the ranks of the lesser and greater Revenants. Once the dust settled, a second wave of explosions wreak havoc among the revenants. What before she could complete her sentence, large objects began falling from the sky, landing right in front of the duo. The drop pods containing reinforcements from the Failnaught battleship have arrived, as the drop pods landed. They crushed the revenants they landed on. The sides of the drops then blew upon due to the pneumatic release mechanism. From each drop pod, eight combat droids filled out, equipped with either concentrated plasma dispersers, which are essentially flamethrowers that fire concentrated beams of high temperature plasma or particle disruptors which dealt damage by disrupting the bonds that held molecules together. Drop pods. Impossible there shouldn't be any starships left on Terra ever since the flood. Who are you and where did you come from? Irene exclaimed, pointing her gay bulg at Rhea. Her weariness now through the roof. Hey is that how you treat the people who saved you? Rhea exasperatedly responds. This is this and that is that. I am immensely grateful for you and your comrades assistance. We would be dead without your help. But, as the commander of the guards of Sixth Haven, I need to ascertain your intentions for the safety of the Haven. <laughs> you are actually quite competent aren't you? Rhea cheerfully said. Suddenly a loud crash occurred behind Rhea. A large hound-like creature with a shaggy green coat was launched forcefully into the ground. Another Kusaith, but I don't have strength to fight another one. Irene laments. Hey Rhea. This big dog looked interesting so I punched it real hard, but no matter what I do, I can't do any damage. Inanna said as she stood atop the fallen Kusaith. Of course, unless you are unawake and you cannot deal damage to titled classes. Irene exclaims. Awakened? What is that? Inanna confusedly asks, staring at Rhea. How would I know? I too just got here you know. But from what I gather only void energy can damage it. I see, in that case, come sha- Wait, I will handle this one. There are other titled class revenants as you call them in the horde right? Rhea confirms as she looked Irene. Yes. Irene replies, still weary of Rhea. You heard her, go handle the ones in the horde. The combat droids can't deal with them, okay. I will handle the others, titled classes probably contain void energy, you can try to differentiate them that way. Rhea says just as an inner left, with an inner gone. There was nothing pinning down the Kusaith anymore, the giant hounds slowly stood back up and its hateful eyes bearing down on Iron and Rhea, undaunted by the gaze of the Kusaith. Rhea began slowly walking towards the wrathful hound. She analyzed the situation and determined that wiping out the entire horde might be the better, even if the attack drains her severely. The blood of the innocent and pure flows. The scales of judgment have shifted. Those who are wronged shall rest. Those who wronged, the eternal flames of judgment shall consume. Let the evening bells toll. Judgment. Terminusist final adjudication, as Ra's decree. Rhea tapped the bottom of Jaina on the ground. A light rippled spreading across the battlefield from Rhea, the evening bell tolls signaling the approaching end. The sound of the bells could be heard throughout the battlefield, 
From behind Rio a wave of purple butterflies swept across the battlefield, landing on the bodies of the revenants. The Kusith slowly closes its eyes and falls over, as if it is going into a peaceful sleep, its body slowly dissipating into golden particles. This effect was not isolated to the Kusith, many other revenants followed suit. They seemingly drifted off into a peaceful sleep before disappearing into golden particles. This effect could be particularly noted in almost all titled revenants and large swaths of the lesser and greater revenant forces. However another effect could also be seen, certain revenants, most notably of the lesser and greater kind, burst into a pyre of greenish-purple flames. They thrashed and flayed wildly, releasing a silent scream their bodies slowly burning up into ash. What remains were small floating purple fires, that were soon absorbed into the lantern attached to Jaina. What remains were the quiet empty streets, peppered with craters from the battle. Multiple drop pods, littered the ground, squads of droids stood unmoving in the open, the battle having ended with no hostiles in sight. Inanna approached with a great sword in hand, a pouty look on her face. You send me out a deal with the titled class revenants but before I could do anything you went ahead and ended everything. In a complaint to Rhea. Sorry, sorry. I thought that ending this battle quickly will be better and I haven't used that skill in so long. It's very hard to land after all. Rhea Riley smiled as she scratched her hair. Irene approached the two, as gripped her gay bulg tightly till her palms were white. On one hand they were the saviors of the Sixth Haven and one that she owes her life to, she would love to be able to trust them fully and show them the full hospitality the Sixth Haven has to offer, but on the other hand after witnessing such a display of power, technologies that haven been lost in ages, she was afraid, afraid of their intentions, should they turn on her and the Sixth Haven. Footsteps could be heard rushing over from behind Iron. The guardsmen stood behind her with their weapons drawn and pointed at Ryu and Inanna. They did not know what the situation was like, but they trusted their commander and since she had yet to stand down and seemed weary against the two new faces, they decided to follow suit. Let me ask again, who are you and what are your intentions? 1. A1C for Aftermath. Ria, what are we gonna do? Should we get Selene to handle this? She was the one who voted to interfere anyway. Inanna whispered, of course not, if she comes down now, it will cause even more friction, it's best she doesn't appear until the issue is resolved, Rhea replied under her breath, what are you whispering about over there, can you answer my question, the two parties stared at each other, not knowing what action to take, Rhea's group had no idea how to explain their situation and identities, even then, they did not know whether Ryan would believe their story. They could try to make up a story regarding their identities, but without information about this weird world they found themselves in, such a move would only serve to increase Irene's suspicion due to the massive plot holes in their backgrounds. On Irene's side, she did not really want to aggravate the situation any further, she desperately didn't want the situation to get out of hand, however, she needed to do her job and prevent uncertain elements from entering the haven. If things went south, she knew that due to the existence of the drop pods, there should be a starship somewhere above them. They could bombard all them without them even being able to react, not to mention their individual combat prowess. You know, we could stare at each other all day and nothing will change, Command Ryrene. I know you have some reservations about letting them in, but they did save us, so I doubt they have bad intentions, Gregson spoke up breaking the tense atmosphere. I mean, you did let those two young boys in earlier without much hassle, didn't you? That's because they clearly aren't a threat. However, those two on the other hand are a completely separate issue, Irene said, waving her spear at Ryu and Inanna. Commander, I know, Gregson. Fine, you win, I will let them through. However, you will tell me your story once we get in, and I will be keeping a very close eye on you. Got it, Irene emphasized, dematerializing her weapon. Irene turned around, gesturing for Ryu and Inanna to follow her. The other guardsmen also lowered their weapons. Inanna, rendezvous with Celine and set up a base somewhere nearby. Once I settle things over here, I will meet up with you two. Okay, but Celine has been strangely quiet the entire time. I wonder why, Inanna pondered. 
there was simply no need for my input on anything regarding possible base sites. I found a large clearing close by earlier and have already started sending dropships of supplies and combat droids over there to secure the area, Selene responded. Oh, you sure do work fast as usual, all right. Send me the coordinates, and I'll head over right away. So, see you later, Rhea. In an waved goodbye and dashed down the street that was just recently a battlefield with the combat droids in tow. After seeing in a leave. Rhea quickly went to catch up with the departing Irene. As she passed by Gregson, he whispered towards Rhea, Apologies for earlier, our commander can get a bit stubborn and tunnel vision sometimes. Don't worry, it was an understandable reaction anyway. Rhea gave a bright smile, quickly dismissing his concerns. After catching up with Irene, Rhea slowed down her speed and walked beside her. Where did that other girl go? I sent her off to do something. Why? Nothing one less person to keep track of, I guess. After that brief conversation, an awkward silence formed between the two again as they made their way past the gates, with Rhea sticking closely to Irene. I want to ask, but why are you sticking so close to me? Irene questioned, her eyebrows twitching. Rhea sauntered in front of Irene and leaned close to her with a cheeky smile. You wanted to keep a close eye on me right? A small giggle escaped her lips. I see. Huh? That's not the response I expected. Whatever, I guess. Walking through the gate, the sight that greeted Rhea was surprisingly normal. It looked like a standard urban district that could be commonly found in any ecumenopolis. Multi-layered platforms with tall, pure white skyscrapers built on top of them. Lights still on within the numerous skyscrapers. Lights installed within the floors and street lamps lit up the dim and dark streets. On the sides of the roads were patches of artificial grass and trees, decorating the dreary urban landscape with a hint of greenery. Civilians walked around without a care in the world, as if a giant battle was not just recently at their doorstep. They strolled around minding their own business while performing their daily routines. As the pair walked down the street, the countless pedestrians paid them no heed. Occasionally, a few civilians acknowledged Irene's existence, though with a hint of contempt in their eyes. Irene, who is the commander of the guards, should certainly have drawn attention, especially after such a battle. But, I know what you want to ask, but best we don't do it out here. We are heading to my personal house, we can talk there. Heeding Irene's advice, Rhea withheld her questions and silently examined the surroundings as she continued to follow Irene. Eyes of Sharma eyes that ascertain all. Rhea's eyes turned bright golden, allowing her to ascertain the truth in people's words and actions and allowing her to judge their morality. Depending on which way their morals lie and the actions they took in life, Rhea would be able to perceive an aura around the person. The darker the aura, the more evil deeds the person had accumulated, while the opposite was also true. Rhea never used these eyes in battle, as the aura surrounding a person was frankly distracting. Rhea scanned the surrounding area, taking in the sights and noting the information she received from the eyes of Shamash. Before long, Irene stopped in front of a large mansion-like building. Compared to the multi-story apartment complexes she had seen many civilians commuting from, it was quite a luxurious living space, quite excessive for one person, don't you think? I agree, however, as one of the few awakened in the haven and being the commander of the guards, it was allocated for my usage, have to maintain an image after all. Irene shrugged as she opened the front gate, with Rhea following right behind her. The mansion's interior was that of a typical European style, normally on an ecumenopolis. Efficiency and population density are prioritized. Owning land itself is highly uncommon, and building a personal residence on it was even more so. The previous owners were probably really rich or had influential friends in high places. Irene brought Rhea to a drawing room on the first floor, urging her to sit on the couch. Irene went to the side of the room, took a teapot out of a drawer and placed a tea bag in it before submerging it in hot water. Irene then took a couple of teacups and placed them in front of Rio and herself, before pouring tea into them. Sorry, no fresh leaves, too poor to afford it here, Irene sarcastically said, gesturing towards the teapot. So, what do you want to know? Rio gleefully said, sipping on her tea. Before I came to Sixth Haven, 
I was the vice commander of the Praetorian Guards the guards tasked with guarding the inner sanctum in the capital. I dealt with a lot of upper management and politicians back there due to my position. What are you trying to say? Rhea said, her tone getting slightly colder, still trying to act oblivious to her implication. Still playing dumb, I see. So let me spell it out for you. I've been dealing with people who hide behind masks of falsity and deception for a very long time. I spot an act when I see it. So why don't you drop yours? I can tell that it is particularly exhausting for you too. An air of silence formed between the two, both staring deep into each other's eyes. The silence continued for a while until Rhea broke it by opening her mouth. So, shall we get down to business? Rhea's tone changed, now neutral and blank. So, this is your normal. There was a hint of surprise in Iron's voice. Well now, can you ask my question from earlier? Who are you, and what are you doing here? Rhea then proceeded to reply to her questions honestly, their story was absurd enough as it is, and Irene could believe whatever she wanted. She couldn't act on such information to begin with, it would be tough to make something believable up anyway, so it was best to tell the truth and try to gain Irene's trust. They needed a local to be their guide anyway, and someone competent and straightforward like Irene was preferable to the alternatives, it's quite unbelievable but it lines up with my knowledge of the events that transpired back then. And your appearance lines up with what I know about Commander Rhea of the Avalon. I was present at that fateful battle, after all, you were there, that happened almost 600 years ago. No matter how much gene therapy has improved over the years, it should be impossible for one to live for that long. Such basic knowledge, yet you are clueless about it, makes your story more believable. I will explain what happened in the past 600 years after your disappearance. 600 years ago, during the Battle of the Kyulosh star system, the planetary assault carrier Avalon, operated by the private military company of the same name, engaged an unknown megastructure that had disabled the coalition fleet. After the destruction of the megastructure, a huge energy nova of unknown type and magnitude swept across the battlefield destroying the Dominion ships and causing the Avalon to fall into a rift in space. However, the Energy Nova did not stop at the star system and spread throughout the galaxy and beyond, to the point that sensors could not detect it anymore. After the event now known as the Cataclysm transpired, massive changes swept through the galaxy. First was that people stopped aging. The cut-off point was six years old. Anyone below that age would stop growing once they hit six years old. Anyone above it simply stopped aging then and there. The second and the most important effect was that there were no more newborns. Whether through natural or artificial means, anything born anew would either die upon conception or would horrifically mutate to the point that they would die soon after. Even cloning was unsuccessful as the clones would never gain consciousness even if everything seemed perfectly normal on the surface. The cause is completely unknown. Third was the appearance of the awakened. Occasionally, people would develop skills that were supernatural, completely defying the established common sense. Their physical abilities would be drastically increased, allowing them to perform unnatural feats of strength. They would also develop a special ability exclusive to them and the instinctive knowledge to use them effectively. Before long, societies became more focused around the awakened. Fourth was the negation of hyperspace travel. After the battle of the Numa star system, the remaining ships from both sides quickly warped out of the star system and back to their home bases. Shortly after that, around a year or so, Warp space became so unstable that anyone attempting long-distance warp travel was never seen again. Lastly, was the appearance of a mysterious storm that spread through space, effectively isolating various star systems. Communication couldn't pass through the storm, and ships would be completely torn to shreds if they attempted to pass through. The various powers lost contact with each other for around 550 years already. That's a lot has changed. Rhea stared dumbfounded. That's not the worst part. That mysterious storm shows no sign of stopping, and its spread has been increasing lately, based on information I received from various sources within the capital. Before long, this place would also be consumed by the storm, and later there will be no space left untouched by the storm, effectively ending all life. The world is ending, 
and yet it feels like no one is trying to prevent it. I don't know what it's like on other planets that still might harbor life, but over here it is frankly impossible for any research to be conducted. After all, according to Irene, the start of the Revenant outbreak on Terra is currently unknown. Maybe some of the higher-ups from the past who still yet live might know, but she was not privy to that information. But once the outbreak started, a section of land was quickly developed into a quarantine zone of sorts. However, rampant corruption prevented the quarantine zone, or more affectionately dubbed Project, Thule, from being completed properly. Research labs, factories for the production of materials, equipment, weapons, vehicles, and even starships were planned. Agricultural districts and water production facilities were supposed to be built in large quantities to support the population plan to be evacuated to Thule. However, corrupt officials completely stifled the plan with bureaucratic nonsense and red tape while, on the other hand, performing underhand dealings for the construction of their private residences before the essential facilities. By the time the corruption hit Thule, while their fancy residences were ready, the planned research labs were never constructed. The material fabricators were not built to the desired quality, leading to a massive shortage. Only the weapons factory was completed, and only 20% of the agricultural district was finished. The corruption soon began creeping through the unfinished tunnels connecting to the outside world that were not sealed up, causing the situation they have today. Thanks to these shortcomings, there isn't enough food and water to go around and thus the 5th to 1st Haven hoarded all the resources, leaving the 7th to 10th Haven to die out. The 6th Haven was an exception due to it being the barrier between the inner havens and whatever was out there. With material fabrication greatly reduced, we cannot spare anything to complete the remaining construction projects, and without the research labs and the data that was lost due to it not being transferred over here in time. We cannot research more effective means of handling the revenants. I understand the situation for the most part now. So how did you get here? From what it sounds like, you had a pretty high position in the capital. What happened? That's pretty simple. My brother Zeno Lyadmla was the commander of the Praetorians until one day he was sent on an operation and never returned. Later, we received word that he was killed in action but they couldn't recover the body. Even a lobotomized idiot could see the writing on the wall. I immediately requested a transfer to the Sixth Haven shortly after the incident, and it was quickly approved. Rhea sat there, processing the information she just received, sipping her now lukewarm cup of tea. Irene. How do you feel about this place, huh? Where is this coming from? What I feel about it? I mean, it's quite nice, I guess. I love the people at the guards. And while there are problems within the walls, I still like it here. Without much contemplation, Rhea offered Irene a proposal. Irene Lyadmla, I want you to guide us to the capital. I know you cannot leave right now with the revenants at your doorstep. So I have a proposal for you. I will help you gain control of the Sixth Haven and help secure the area around it. Once that is done, you will help me get to the capital. According to your story, we cannot leave this sector of space anyway. So we might as well clean up this planet if we are going to stay here. I don't think it's a bad deal at all. You will secure the safety of the Sixth Haven, and with Avalon's expertise and technology, we might be able to clean up the Revenant threat once and for all. Gain control? The darkness that permeates this city is quite deep. Judging by people I have seen as we walked through the streets earlier. I noticed from the battle earlier that only your subordinates participated. But there should be more, shouldn't it? You also mentioned that Awakened had been dispatched to the Sixth Haven, meaning that there should be more than just you, but I didn't notice anyone of that sort earlier, correct? So, how about it? Rio extended her hand, waiting for Irene's response. 1. A1C5 Rhea Pendragon. Next. Irene looked at Rhea's outstretched hand, contemplating the offer. Honestly, the offer was very favorable for her. Though she had spent more time within the capital. She considered Sixth Haven her second home. She had many friends and comrades within the guards and other places, and though not everyone appreciated her presence, she still wanted to protect them. It wasn't because of her job or anything, she personally liked the place and did not want to see it fall. With Rhea's help, 
she could secure the future and safety of Sixth Haven. While not explicitly stated in Rhea's offer, her path would surely lead to a change in the capital, whether it be positive or negative. With her presence, she could help guide the changes in real time and hopefully stand beside Rhea, likely preventing an undesirable outcome. It was leagues better than letting Rhea go off on her own. Technological development on Terra had not progressed much since the cataclysm, due to the circumstances surrounding Thule's creation. The appearance of the revenants, and the isolation of various sectors of space due to the mysterious space storm, with Avalon's technological capabilities, which were already generations ahead of its time back then, they could very well come up with a permanent solution to the revenant threat. All in all, there were essentially zero downsides for her, it made the decision very easy to make. Irene then reached out her hand and grabbed Rhea's. I accept, but please keep collateral damage on the down low. Thank you for contracting Avalon. I am sure our service will not disappoint. A business smile flashed across Rhea's face. Well, it's been a long and tiring day for both of us. How about we call it here and pick this back up tomorrow? Sure, follow me. I will lead you to your room. The two exited the drawing room and went up the central staircase towards the second floor. Iron led Rhea to an open room and passed along its respective key to her. Afterwards, they said their goodbyes, and Irene left for her own room while Rhea entered hers. Rhea walked towards the bed and collapsed onto it, her gaze glued to the ceiling, deep in thought. We have secured a guide, and I already have a plan in mind to secure control of Sixth Haven. It will take some time, but it will likely work if nothing goes horribly wrong. My condition is also stable at the moment. No risk of going into the berserk state. Plenty of resources down here to harvest to satiate my appetite, though it is less fulfilling than normal but should not be an issue. Rhea then focused her concentration deep within herself, trying to contact Jaina, who had disappeared shortly before they were dragged into the spatial tier. After a few minutes of trying with no response, Rhea gave up when suddenly a brief message from Jaina entered her mind, I will return soon, but not now. There are forces here preventing me from appearing. I have to leave now before it notices. Jaina hurriedly informed Rhea before severing the connection completely. Something able to prevent Jaina from appearing. Is it by her choice or is there something forcefully stopping her? It's another thing to investigate, I suppose. But with that, I can confirm that energies from the void have invaded this dimension. Most of the happenings could be traced back to that place. However, if Irene's story is to be believed, it places the triggering event when Wrong Aminiad was used on the Dominion megastructure. Based on calculations, such reaction shouldn't have been able to tear open a rift to the void. With the characteristics of Wrong Aminiad fully known to Rhea, the only variable is the megastructure. It is likely that it wasn't a layered singularity core that Rhea believed it was due to the energy signature it outputted but something else entirely. The only conclusion that can be drawn is that the Dominion intentionally disguised the megastructure as a layered singularity core, expecting Avalon to unleash wrong Aminiad at it, meaning they intentionally opened a rift to the void, essentially causing an apocalyptic doomsday scenario to occur, Altar of Ascension. I think that is what the Dominion soldier called it. If this was intentional, it is probably that unknown advisor's doing. And if the plan required the use of wrong Aminiad, it meant that this advisor knew the full capabilities of Avalon, which also allows him to make plans to breach the ship. The mystery of this Dominion advisor deepens, however, Rhea brushed aside thoughts about that matter as they do not pertain to the situation at hand. They were nowhere close to Dominion space and had no means of investigating, and she could also not confirm whether the person themselves is even alive. Rhea sat up from the bed and operated a device on the wrist, bringing up a holographic screen in front of her. She navigated the menus and contacted both Inanna and Celine. Rhea, did you need something? Celine's holographic image appeared on a screen. Kind of busy here. I am disconnecting from the call. You can talk to Celine. Inanna entered the call briefly before immediately leaving. What is going on over there? Selene informed Rhea that they were fighting with the Revenant over the clearing they spotted earlier. Apparently, the Revenants were also pretty smart or had someone commanding them from the back, as when Selene and Avalon went there to secure the area, 
The Revenant forces already had a foothold there. Structures of creep were already being constructed. Inanna was leading the assault on the Revenant base, fighting off waves of lesser and greater Revenants together with the combat droids, with the occasional titled classes appearing. Unlike the siege on Sixth Haven, there was a surprisingly small number of titled classes, and even then, only the weaker ones appeared. Inanna was easily able to dispatch them. Selene was already boots on the ground and led reinforcements with emphasis on heavy weapons and vehicles such as assault tanks and artillery platforms, which were more effective on the structures, and with their large area O effect weapons, they were able to cleave through large numbers of revenants easily. Though on the ground, Selene still had control of the Failnaught battleship, and she used it to its full effect by heavily bombarding the enemy's position. Though progress was still slow, the output of revenants from the structures was ridiculously quick. Able to quickly reform their ranks, the Avalon had weapons that made use of void energy to enhance its performance and capabilities, but the Failnaught battleship had no such weapons on board for the reason that they were not expecting the use of it and that such weapons were also not easy to make, even aboard the Avalon. This caused the damage dealt by the battleship to be heavily reduced against the titled classes and structures, which both contained void energy within them. All right. Update me on the situation later on. I will send you a report on what I have learned later. You can read it when you are free. Understood. Once we secure the area, we will send word. Selene out. The call disconnected with Selene leaving. Rhea once again collapsed on the bed, her body laden with exhaustion. They had gone through two tough and long consecutive battles in a row. Even though the battles were close to 600 years apart from each other, for Rhea and the rest of Avalon, it was merely an instant. Rhea's eyes slowly grew heavier until she could no longer open them and she drifted off into the land of dreams. She had no dreams that night and simply slept away all the accumulated fatigue. Only awakening when the sound of knocking could be heard. Rhea rubbed her eyes and got up, slowly dragging her feet towards the door. As she opened the door, she saw Irene standing in front of her, all dressed up. Not much of a morning person, I suppose. Come down to the dining hall with me. I already got us breakfast. We can discuss your plans there too. Rhea ruffled her hair a bit before following Iron out of the door. Her eyes still half closed. They went down the same central staircase and took a right to head to the dining hall. Once inside, there was a plate of eggs, sausages, bacon, and bread. Irene and Rhea sat opposite each other at the table as they had their meal. We can talk while we eat. I have to go report on yesterday's battle later on in the afternoon. After breakfast. We will head out, and I will show you around the place. After that, you can do whatever you want, but first, we have to get your identity straight. We can't go around telling people your actual backstory, after all. I already thought about it last night, so here is your background. Can you act, right? Rhea Pendragon, daughter of a high-ranking official from the capital. Using her father's influence, she placed herself in a high-ranking position within the Seventh Haven, Despite her lack of experience in the matters at hand, despite protests, she managed to remain in that position until the fall of the Seventh Haven. With the help of an escort, she managed to navigate her way to the Sixth Haven. Due to her pampered upbringing, she is arrogant and spiteful. To explain Rhea's relation to Irene, it is decided that Irene would owe favors to this imaginary father of Rhea's from way back in the past. After hearing about her daughter's plight, the father would cash in all the owed favors for Irene to take care of Rhea for the foreseeable future. She would also be appointed as a special advisor within the guards. I assume you have reasons for this particularly nasty background you have chosen. Of course, to preface this, I already imposed a gag order within the guards about your existence. I will further brief them about this mud up backstreet later too. They trust me, so they would definitely follow the script. It also helps that they have a positive impression of you since you saved their lives, after all, the most important agenda we have to settle to gain control of this haven would be the underworld. They hold a lot of power here and have their hands in almost all aspects of life within this haven. I think I see the picture now, Rhea Pendragon definitely couldn't stay in such an influential position for long, 
even with her father's influence. Based on what you said about the various havens yesterday, her father's influence wouldn't have lasted long in the seventh haven due to the distance. The fact she maintained her power for so long despite her position would be likely due to corruption, I suppose. Yes, and with your position as a special advisor within the guards, the underworld would definitely try to make contact with you once this information gets to them. You also mentioned this escort in the Baxtry. Who would that be? Or would the escort be dead in this case after I supposedly threw them under the bus? Ah yes, the escort. To corroborate your story, we need some first-hand accounts, and luckily, on the day itself, right before you arrived, there were two refugees from the Seventh Haven who made their way here. One of them is even an awakened, so he could comfortably pass as an escort. Once we confirmed the deal yesterday, I quickly took them under my wing and had them join the guards. I will have their story much hours in order to strengthen the integrity of your background. All right. I assume we will be heading immediately to guards headquarters first thing after breakfast? Correct. We don't have much time before the meeting, so we need to quickly head over. There is a lot to cover, after all. Rhea nodded in response, and both girls quickly finished their breakfast. Before leaving the mansion, Irene had Rhea wear a black cloak that covered her entire body to avoid attracting attention before her background was settled. With the perpetual darkness and the dim lighting, Rhea could easily blend into the shadows as they made their way towards the guards' headquarters. The headquarters was a large government-looking building that was pretty plain and blended in with the other buildings nearby. Approaching the entrance, there were four guards stationed at the gate, preventing any unauthorized visitors from entering. Commander, welcome back, you can head in as usual, but who is that beside you, daughter of some bigwig that I owed some favors to back in the day? The bastard cashed them in recently, so I have to oblige. Irene frustratedly said, her annoyance apparent in her voice. I understand, must be tough. Anyways, both of you are cleared to go in. The guard said as their gaze bore down onto Rhea, his apparent disdain directed at her. TCH, how dare you mongrels look at me this way. When I Rhea snapped at the guards, her words dripping with venom, her hand raised and ready to slap the guard before Irene yanked her arm away, interrupting her. Don't cause any problems, you hear? I agreed to take you in because of your father, but if you dare harm my people, I will make you regret it. Irene snapped back at Rhea, dragging her into the building by her arm. The two made it to Irene's personal office without encountering anyone else after that due to it being still very early. As soon as the doors to the office closed, Rhea removed her cloak and threw it aside before plopping herself down on the nearby sofa. I didn't expect you to do that earlier. The plan was for us to head in discreetly. I had to. It would be a character break otherwise. If the guards just ignored me, it would have been fine to stick to that plan. But having slighted me with that glare, if I did not respond to it accordingly, it would be odd. Well done, I suppose. Anyways. Stay here for a while. I will go fetch the relevant people and bring them to the conference hall. Afterwards, I will come back and bring you over. Irene instructed before leaving her office. Rhea laid back on the couch and looked around the office. It was a simple office, practical and functional. A large wooden desk for Irene to do her work. Multiple locked shelves placed at the side of the room. The sofa set and coffee table that Rhea was sitting on currently and a few decorative plants here and there to spruce up the place. Rhea operated the bracelet on her wrist and brought up the holographic screen, checking through it. She did not find any signs of communication from Selene or Anona on the device, which only meant that the battle was still not over, even after half a day had passed. Deciding to get a status report on their progress. Rhea navigated the menus and prepared to contact Celine for a status update. However, just as she was about to hit the call button, she heard footsteps from outside approaching the door. She immediately closed the holographic screen and waited to see what the person at the door was about to do. Knock, knock. Uh, Commander, you said you wanted to see me at the start of the day yesterday. Are you available now? Is he an idiot? This is your commander's office. Why would you come in without permission, even if it is unlocked? The young man entered the room carrying a brown folder with him. As he looked around trying to find Iron, his black eyes met Rhea's. The young man, 
who resembled a young boy of around the age of 15, looked confusedly at Rhea. He was shorter than Rhea by a head and had dark blue hair. He wore the uniform of the guards, a normal-looking uniform for a soldier, with a grayish-white pat camouflage on his shoulder was a blank epaulette that showed that he was a private. Who are you? The young boy stammered, intimidated due to Rhea being in her full combat outfit. Her weapon drawn, Rhea slowly walked up towards the boy, invading his personal space. The boy, in turn, stumbled backward trying to distance himself from Ryu until his back was up against the shelving placed at the room's sides. Without caring about his space, Ria stood right up in front, her eyes glaring hatefully down at him. I should be the one asking that. Who are you? Ria menacingly said in a low voice, Private Lucas Aulia. So, Private Aulia, what are you doing entering the commander's office without permission? I, you what? Ria shouted slamming her hand against the shelves beside him. Are you a spy or something? The commander's office contains highly classified intelligence and documents. I should call Marshal you where you stand. Wait. I didn't mean to. However, there is another option. I could accept a generous gift to look another way. Rhea leaned in close to his ears and whispered. I before Lucas could get another word out, Irene's voice rang from outside the office. Hey Rhea. I gathered the people except I couldn't find, one, of them. Irene stood there shocked, at the scene unfolding in her office, both Rio and Irene blankly staring at each other, Private Lucas, please head to the conference hall immediately. Irene ordered. Taking the opportunity, Lucas ducked under Rhea's hand and sprinted as fast as he could out of the room. As soon as he left the room, Irene closed the door and properly locked it this time. Rhea then explained the situation about what happened in the officer to Irene. Sorry, I think the boy misunderstood me yesterday. I said I would look for him, but instead he seemed to have gone to look for me. I will also talk to him about entering the offices without permission. I was surprised that someone would actually enter the office of the commander of their unit without explicit permission beforehand. By the way, that boy is the supposed escort of yours that I mentioned and now you have gone and made a horrendous first impression, on the bright side, he is getting a taste of the experience he would be having in the future. Well, you said the lot is gathered, right? So let's head down now and not keep them waiting. The pair quickly made their way to the conference hall on the ground floor, avoiding the regularly taken paths to avoid encountering unrelated personnel. As they entered the conference hall, they saw a large number of guardsmen sitting in an auditorium-style hall. The guards sitting down also turned around and looked at them. Rhea recognized some of the faces as those that were fighting at the front line, such as Gregson. And she also saw the young boy from earlier sitting beside another young boy who looked similar to him, likely a close relative of sorts. The moment the boy saw her, he immediately looked away and stared at the ground. Irene and Rhea walked up to the stage at the front and turned to face the audience. Good morning. I gathered everyone today to brief you about an important matter. You can treat this matter as the highest order. It concerns the person standing beside me right now. Most of you here should recognize her from yesterday and have a good impression of her. After Irene mentioned Rhea, the guards began murmuring and pointing at Rhea likely remembering her from the siege yesterday. And some of you, well, to be more specific, one of you might have a pretty bad experience with her. Irene said as soon as the crowd quieted down, while giving a passing glance at Lucas. To address that issue first, Private Lucas, about what happened earlier. Please forget about it. She was only acting her part. She didn't mean what she said at all. Well most of it at least. We have to talk about your conduct in private later. Moving on, this person is Rhea Pendragon. She is a close collaborator of mine, but she will be having a forged background while she is around here and will be acting accordingly, so please do play along. Irene then proceeded to tell the crowd, which consisted of her most trusted subordinates, about the background that Rhea would be playing out during her time in the guards, without mentioning the plans to take control of the Sixth Haven as she couldn't be sure that information would not leak out and reveal Rhea's true identity. So what is the purpose of this forged background of hers? A guard Rhea recognized as Gregson asked. Gregson, come to my office later. I will talk to you about it in detail over there. Understood, 
Commander. After explaining Rhea's forged background to the crowd, Irene turned to Lucas and his brother Adrian, who were sitting beside each other, and addressed them personally. Private Lucas and Private Adrian, you came in yesterday right before the siege and were not present. But for this cover story, you two are the most important pieces. You two entered alone yesterday before the siege, but that will be changed from this moment onwards. Now you two will be the escorts of Rhea from the Seventh Haven, so instead of a party of two entering the Haven yesterday, it will be a party of three. Irene then filled in the other details with the two brothers in front of the crowd so everyone present would be on the same page. I will sit down with you two later to discuss the so-called bad rumors about Rhea during her time at the Seventh Haven. I will fetch you from your rooms when it is time. After dealing with the two brothers, Irene turned towards the entire audience and addressed them for the final time in this meeting. So any questions? And though I don't think this needs to be mentioned, but no one should mention anything about Rhea's actual capabilities. Got it? Understood. The entire auditorium acknowledged simultaneously. All right. This right as Irene was about to dismiss the crowd, a guard ran into the conference hall, panting heavily, Commander you say her position is that of a special advisor but where is that supposed to be in the hierarchy? Ah, I forgot about that. It's the same position as you Gregson. Understood. Any other questions? If not dismissed. The assembly then filled out of the auditorium and proceeded to continue their daily tasks. Iron, what position is Gregson supposed to be anyways? I didn't mention it. He is my second in command. One. 